you know, my trucking business, I had to uh, shut that down. Um, the cost was, was getting too high. Um, so, you know, I sold the truck. Um, I was, I was um, lucky enough to get uh, um, enough money to pay the truck off and a little bit more cash. So I was able to pay off bills that um, was accumulated for the trucking business. Um, they just wasn't paying enough. And the gas prices are going up. Um, you know, New York City is, is about $150 just to enter New York City. And a lot of these dispatchers was, was you know, um, charging me 400 well, was paying $400 straight truck load to um, enter New York City. So that's $150 right there. You know, and plus gas. You know, so unfortunately, I just kind of like had to, um, um, just you know, just just weigh out the losses. Um, I was putting out more money than I was making for the last three months, so I'm going to move in the direction of getting a tractor trailer. Tractor trailer will be more lucrative. I would ask you to ask yourself: Are we better off with this bill than the uncertainty that's in the law today? And I think we are. And I think as we move forward and continue to push it, we will be even more so. So I respectfully ask for an eye today to keep this discussion going, to keep moving, to protect workers, to give certainty to businesses, and to protect California taxpayers. That was former California Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, who authored State Bill AB5 back in 2019. AB5 was signed by Governor Gavin Newsom and aimed to reclassify independent contractors like rideshare drivers, journalists, even strippers as employees. Legislators said it would improve worker protections and benefits for workers across the gig economy. But the laws had ripple effects across different industries, and truckers who move goods out of Southern California ports and across our highways are threatening a work stoppage. These truckers who own their own trucks say they like the freedom of working as a contractor and that the law hurts their ability to make ends meet. Joining us to talk about all of this is Catherine Fisk. She's a law professor at UC Berkeley. Hey, Catherine. Hi, Marisa. Also with us is Joe Rekovitz. He is Director of Government Affairs for the Western States Trucking Association. They have over a 1,000 of these independent truckers as members. Hey, Joe. Hey, good to be here. So, Catherine, let's start with you. Can you just explain what is AB5 and who it was aimed at? What was the goal of this legislation? AB5 was legislation enacted in California to make workers have the legal category of employees for purposes of California law. Employees under California law are those who are entitled to unemployment insurance in times of economic downturn, entitled to workers' compensation if they are injured or become ill on the job. They're entitled to health benefits, paid sick leave, family leave, all the protections against the risk of loss or injury under California law. Okay, so the aim is to protect workers, um, but there's been a lot of pushback. Has it worked so far? Are we seeing employees getting better benefits and, and, you know, having these protections actually play out? Sure. In March of 2020, when the entire economy shut down because of the pandemic, those workers who were employees could file for unemployment insurance. And that protected themselves, their families, their communities, and of course, the entire economy from the catastrophe of economic shutdown. Those who were not employees got nothing although eventually Congress enacted a stopgap measure that then lapsed, providing for some unemployment benefits for independent contractors. So, Catherine, I know that when AB5 passed, it it was aimed at encompassing a really wide universe of industries and types of workers, but a lot have received carve-outs, both by the legislature and also through things like Prop 22, which was passed by voters um, to give rideshare drivers, Uber and Lyft, a carve-out. What is the argument for making truckers specifically comply? 
The argument for making truckers comply is that this is an industry which for a century operated on the employee model. They were employees of the trucking companies and logistics companies. It was a good middle class job. And the companies were in a position to spread the cost of illness, injury, economic downturn, and maintaining a fleet of trucks across their entire business through insurance to consumers through equitable sharing of the risk of loss with shareholders and executives. That worked pretty well for a century. It was only at the turn of the 21st century or in the late 20th century that companies figured out they could make more profit if they shifted the entire risk of loss and the cost of maintaining a fleet of trucks from the company and its shareholders to the drivers And the legislation is simply intended to shift those risks and costs back to the entities that are best able to bear those costs. All right. Well, that sounds like it should work. But I want to bring in Joe Rakovitz. He's director of government affairs for Western States Trucking Association. Uh, Joe, you just heard Catherine lay out that it's only in recent decades that truckers became independent contractors. Um, And yet, you know, yourself and many others are pushing back on this. Why are you so worried about AB5 and the impact on your industry? Well, first, the characterization that this is something new in the 21st century isn't uh, isn't something I would agree with. Uh, Federal regulations going back uh, more than 50 years carved out what are called the uh, leasing regulations. It is part of the federal regulations with USDOT. I myself uh, was an owner-operator for nearly 30 years before I got off the road and went to the association side of the industry in 2006. I was a Teamster early in my career. Uh, I made the choice to become an owner-operator for many other things than what was described earlier. It was a choice of routes. It was a choice to work or not work. It was also to better my income. It significantly improved as an independent contractor in trucking. Now, have there been abuses, uh, especially in the port environment in California? What we view is what was a minor issue in a small segment of the industry was used to broad brush the entire industry had this uh, issue. Uh, in in uh, roughly 2007, if memory serves me correct, uh, you had the clean trucks program at the Ports LA Long Beach. And what occurred there is that the new uh, lower emissions trucks, typically they were natural gas, um, uh, liquefied natural gas, The motor carriers got grants, federal, state, local grants, to buy those trucks, and then they leased them to uh, employee drivers. Um, You know, I was a spokesman at one of their meetings back then. Wrong thing to do. They still went ahead and did it. And this is why... Yeah, so not to cut you off, but just to explain to folks that this is why some truckers at those ports say they're actually losing money being independent contractors these days. Well, correct, but the reality was is that the industry over on the construction side, for instance, is virtually all owner-operators, has been for uh, over over 80 years. You had a really kind of narrow abuse that was happening in a small segment of the industry, and it was used politically to tarnish the whole industry. So, uh, yeah... Just to simplify for our listeners who are experts on the trucking industry, um, you yeah. know, so it, this is something that you say is working for a lot of truckers. And yet, as Catherine brought up, the, you know, the freedom to be independent, as with any contractor, has drawbacks. You value freedom, but what about things like health benefits? What happens if you get hurt on the job? Are there protections that you think are troublesome for truckers as independent contractors? Well, they can be. They certainly can be, but somebody, you know, look, I got a high school diploma. I figured it all out. You know, not everybody starts out on the same plane of knowledge as you're trying to build a business. Um, in independent contractors and trucking, uh, what happens is in, in lieu of 
state-sponsored workers' comp. You get OCAC coverage. It's actually, in my view, much more beneficial than paying uh, workers' comp in terms, uh, you know, because if an owner-operator, somebody owns a, a small business, a truck, with a payment that could be well north of $2,000 a month, if that individual gets injured enough on the job uh, that they've got to collect workers' comp, they're going bankrupt. Uh, workers' comp will not cover their truck payment, their overhead, et cetera. There are other insurance products out there. Certainly some people take advantage of it, others don't. Uh, health insurance, I can tell you that uh, because of tax law changes over the years that reduced the deductibility for sole proprietors from their uh, income taxes, <laughs> I had to deal with that. My wife got the job and got a, our family coverage that way. Many owner-operators go through something like that. The idea that these owner-operators across the board are sitting there without protections and without coverage, uh, that, that, that frankly is not accurate. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Why do you need to go through the trucking companies? It seems like the middleman is what is making this more difficult um, because they're setting a lot of the prices and, and things like that. And it's also what brings you under AB5. Is there a world that you could cut out that middleman and it could just be the truckers themselves? What has happened over the last four decades, uh, corporations used to have shipping departments, and I'm just going to use an example, say Procter & Gamble. They had a shipping department, then truckers would call in, and you know, they would uh, bid on different traffic lanes loads. Corporations don't act like that anymore. They use intermediaries, brokers, to handle their dispatch functions and the payment to owner-operators. No corporation in America wants tens of thousands of phone calls a day. Uh, just in the United States alone, there's over 600,000 federally regulated motor carriers. In the state of California, that number is north of 100,000 and, and somewhat south of 200,000. The numbers are not exact. Uh, there's a huge amount of motor carriers that operate from the smallest straight, the straight trucks that you see, you know, on any freeway around L.A., just uh, de delivering to local markets to the over-the-road trucks. Got it. Catherine, bringing you back in for our last minute, um, you know, Republicans in the legislature have called for a carve-out for truckers, and it strikes me that this is really um, a, a sort of meal piece solution to bigger sort of economic changes that have happened. Do you think there's any chance of a carve-out, and more broadly, does the legislature need to be tackling bigger sort of economic landscape questions? The companies want a carve out or Republicans want to give them a carve out because they want a bigger share of the profits from trucking stuff from the ports to the warehouses. And what the argument is about is who should bear the risk of loss? The drivers, many of whom, as you pointed out, make zero dollars an hour for working or the companies who are able to pass those costs on to the companies they contract with or through a payroll tax system to everybody. Carving out the trucking industry from the protections of the law will just ensure that for many, many drivers, this is an extremely low paying job and as your other caller said, if they need health insurance, for example, for themselves and their families, they'll get it from a spouse who gets a job as an employee. That's just no way to deal with the risk of injury, illness, or economic downturn. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Joe Rekovats, Director of Government Affairs for the Western States Trucking Association. They have over a thousand of these independent truckers as members. And Catherine Fisk, law professor at UC Berkeley. Thanks so much to you both. Thank you. Good to be here. A new human resources company in San Diego is focused on helping businesses manage remote workers. They say the pandemic has shown them that flexibility matters more to employees than working from home. KPBS reporter Thomas Fudge has more.
The startup company Amplisol was begun by three UC San Diego professors who were looking at changes in the workplace. Those changes had begun prior to the pandemic, but were accelerated when people were forced to work from home. Now that restrictions have eased, hybrid work models are the likely result. People don't want to be home all the time. They want a mix of at home and in the office. UCSD economics professor Joshua Graf Ziven is one of the founders of Amplisol. He says workers are less concerned about where they work and more concerned about keeping the flexibility that came with remote work. So that people are saying, you know what, I really want to be able to take my kid to school and then work and then pick up my kid from school and then get them stationed in front of their homework or whatever and then go back to work. You can't do that in a conventional job that has you coming in at eight or nine and have you leaving at five or six. He says there's no evidence that remote work or work flexibility has affected employee productivity. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. Hundreds of San Diego police officers got to skip the COVID vaccine because they said it was against their religion. But it meant that they had to get tested for COVID regularly. And now some officers argue their religion says they can't even get tested. From member station KPBS, Clara Tregesser reports. On a cloudy afternoon in April, San Diego police officers stopped a man for smoking in a public park. What brought you over here today? Just using the bathroom. The man lied about his name and birthday, so they decided to arrest him and ended up tackling him to the ground. Put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. Get off me! Police body camera video shows two officers lying on top of the man. Their faces are next to his face, and they weren't wearing masks. If a police officer is not vaccinated, is declining testing, and is not masked, that could be a really dangerous situation for people. Rebecca Fielding Miller is an epidemiologist at UC San Diego. For Many, many people, it's not voluntary to interact with the police. San Diego requires all city employees to be vaccinated for COVID. But records requests from KPBS show many police officers argued vaccines are against their religion. The city approved those exemptions but required them to take weekly COVID tests. The records, which had the officers' names removed, go on to reveal that some say testing goes against their religion, too. They claim the test swabs contain the carcinogen ethylene oxide, but it's not actually present on the swabs. It's used as a gas to sterilize them. They point to passages from 1 Corinthians about bodies being temples of the Holy Spirit to bolster their claim. It really strains credulity that this would have any application there at all. Caroline's Purdue is a New Testament professor at Point Loma Nazarene University. She says there's a great irony in using the Bible to justify avoiding some small chance of harm. When, you know, so much of the New Testament is focused and really fixated on a testimony to a savior who was willing to undertake death and then told Christians that they would need to take up their cross and follow. The city of San Diego is still negotiating with the police officers, but for now they remain on the job unvaccinated and untested. I think we have been exceedingly patient uh, with these folks. Mayor Todd Gloria says the city has to work with the police union before taking any action. If folks continue to resist being compliant uh, with our adopted vaccine mandate, uh, we will have to terminate their employment with the city, and that would be regrettable. Police in many other cities, New York, Chicago, Seattle, are also using religion to push back on COVID vaccination requirements. But a religious exemption for testing is going too far, according to Larry James. He's the general counsel for the Fraternal Order of Police. I doubt very seriously whether that's going to be a successful argument. He thinks for these officers, it's not really about religion. It's more a philosophical standpoint. Not just that I don't want the government to tell me what to do and what not to do. It says, I want to be the person who decides. But there is no deciding for most people who come in contact with officers. They don't have a choice whether to interact with police. For NPR News, I'm Claire Tregesser in San Diego. The pandemic has changed a lot of things about how we work, including our sense of boundaries. A whole lot of people had to start working remotely during the lockdowns. 
We didn't miss commuting, but our work and home lives got intertwined in a way that was mentally exhausting. Some people missed that boundary, but we got to wear whatever clothes we wanted. We picked up our kids from school and didn't feel guilty about it. Or we quit jobs altogether because we felt like we couldn't be our whole selves there. Now that most Americans are back to the office, some people want that boundary between their work and personal lives to be less rigid. Today in our series, we're going to hear from three people who have decided to integrate their professional selves with the rest of their lives. My name is Jack Elliott. My pronouns are they, them, and he, him. I live in Salem, Oregon. Early March, I was probably sitting at this same dining room table. I was married to someone, and um, I had a different job. I wore different clothes. I even had different glasses. (laughs) My name is Frank Ruiz. I am an educator, actor, musician, and director. Part of what happened with me during the pandemic was I realized I don't want to sit around and wait for someone to make me feel better or like... My name is Kristen Zawatsky. I am a mom of two boys and I am a project manager um, in higher education. My last day in the office was March 12th. I got an email from my kids' school saying, hey, everything was great today. We don't have a lot of cases still. Um, But we're going to close the school tomorrow as a precaution just to clean. Right. And I had a bad feeling about it. So I packed up my laptop. I ordered a monitor off of Amazon to have it shipped to the house. Um, Each of these people, Jack, Frank, and Kristen, had a revelation during the pandemic. The person they were at work wasn't really all of who they were, and they wanted that to change. We're going to start with Jack because Jack changed a lot. The pandemic made them rethink almost every aspect of their life, starting with their marriage. We realized not too long into the pandemic that our marriage had an expiration date. Mm -hmm. And by November of 2020, we had decided that it was best for us to have an amicable split. And then the changes started to extend to Jack's work life. They were a case manager working for a housing program. Jack's work was meaningful, but it came with a lot of stress. I think a lot of folks in human services roles say, well, you know, like it's an honor and a sacrifice to be like present for people in their moments of crisis or present for people in a day-to-day basis when they need us to be there. Um, And my thinking was, if not me, then who? Mm -hmm. And now it's, if not me, it will be someone else. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. As a non-binary person, they felt boxed into a certain public image. And it's complicated. There's always that, you know, voice that says, are people going to take you more seriously if you're wearing a button down and slacks? Or are people going to think that you're professional if you're wearing, you know, if you look like somebody's art professor from a from a small liberal arts college? You know what I mean? (laughs) Frank Ruiz was also reevaluating his life. Frank used to be in musical theater. His parents immigrated to the U.S. from Nicaragua in the 1980s. I was always very proud of where I came from. But he didn't want his cultural identity to determine every role he was given. It's really difficult when people as a whole are forced to, you know, be this one-dimensional version of themselves. At the same time, Frank didn't want to hide his identity. He shared a story from when he was in college. He was studying musical theater and doing really well. His teachers noticed. But one of those teachers who, you know, I cared for deeply, you know, really I felt supported by, told me that, you know, if I really want to do well, I might want to consider changing my last name. They wanted him to try a name that could help him pass as white. It was tricky for me to figure that out because, um... I already knew that my first name was sort of an Americanized version of the name my parents wanted to give me. Francisco is like a family name. Like, my cousins, my mom, everyone has it. And when I was born, they decided to call me Frank, you know, to try and make it easier on me. His mother's maiden name is Martinez, and so Frank Ruiz became Frank Martin. The new name didn't stick for long, but the hurt that came along with changing it did. It's this one, you know, little 
betrayal, if you will, of not trusting that I can be myself and still be successful. You know, it like makes my stomach turn a little bit thinking how quickly I latched onto that idea. And it's still something I deal with now, just thinking about like how long it took me to really realize how hurtful that was. Before the pandemic, Kristen Zawatsky always felt guilty about balancing her work with her kids' needs. I always tried to pick them up like between 5 and 5.30 because we usually had Cub Scouts or soccer or martial arts or swimming lessons, you know, the normal routine. So I would get nervous if I wasn't at work early enough to make sure that I could leave at an acceptable time because I didn't want to have it look like I was leaving early because I was a parent and I you know, wanted to make sure everybody understood I'm committed to my job. And let's just acknowledge that Kristen works in a white collar job as an IT project manager. So she's had the luxury of work flexibility from the start, which a lot of people don't have. Even so, she felt judged. My bosses were always like, oh, I always felt like they were looking at their watch when I was leaving to go get my kids. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, you know, she's leaving again at 4.15. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, Was the pushback, I mean, were you getting all your work done? Yeah, of course. Even leaving by four? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I was getting all my work done. And if I wasn't, I would work at night. Kristen told me the pandemic has made her think differently about her working life. She doesn't sneak out early from work anymore. She's open about when she leaves and why. And now, post-pandemic, like, today's my work from home day, but I took the whole day off because my kids have a half day at school. They're getting out at 11.15 for the year. What if they want to go hang out with their friends or go out for lunch or something like that? So I took the day off. I took Monday off and I did field day with my first graders class. And that's a thing you wouldn't have done before. You wouldn't felt emboldened. I would have, have, but I would have felt guilty about it. And I would have been worried and I would have been checking my email during the day to make sure I wasn't missing anything. I didn't even pull my phone out at field day. Like we, wow. I hung out. I mean, I, I took pictures with my phone, but like I didn't check my email. I didn't check my Slack. I didn't, you know. Why did that happen? What changed? The pandemic was terrifying in the sense that if I got sick, I didn't know if I would be there the next day to, to see my kids. Um, when the va- I cried the day I got my, my COVID vaccine. I cried when my kids got theirs. And mm-hmm. knowing that life could be short, I didn't want to waste it anymore all the time just worrying about what kind of employee I was. Because my, my kids don't care what kind of employee I am. My kids care what kind of mom mm-hmm. I am. Each of these people, Kristen, Frank, and Jack, made a conscious choice during the pandemic to stop compartmentalizing their work selves from the rest of their identities. For Jack Elliott, that's meant a new job where they can draw the boundaries they need and erase those that kept them isolated as a non-binary person. Yeah, I gave away pretty much all my dress shirts. Chambray button downs, all gone? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) I mean... They they looked good on me. I looked okay in those, but like th- that's because that's like what other people wanted to see me in. They've replaced the button down shirts with a new wardrobe staple. You know, like overalls definitely for me represent the perfect like genderless outfit. You know, however you want to style it. And Jack is happier now. They're smiling more. It's like the difference in seeing. You know how you look at the way kids smile and it's just like all teeth and like they're not conscious of their, you know, of the way their chin looks or like if it's flattering or not. It's just it's just pure light. And that's the kind of smile that I get to have now. Frank Ruiz left acting and now he runs education programs at an art center in New Jersey. I feel more authentically myself than I ever have. And he's teaching kids from marginalized communities to feel that, too. I'm in a position to, you know, advocate for the people that remind me of my family. I'm able to present, you know, all of myself in a way that um, I would hope, (laughs) you know, is a benefit to my students. And Kristen Zawatsky has woken up to the flexibility she already had, and she's not taking it for granted. I started to realize that all of the hangups about being away from work to spend time with my kids, that was all me wanting to be a really good employee. Um, but my work speaks for itself. Like I, I do really good work and I know I do. 
And my boss tells me I do. And I, nobody's going to begrudge me an hour to go listen to my kid read a story about a gorilla or, you know, take a day off to go to field day. And I want to do those things now because my 12 year old is going to be 13 in August. And we're getting to the point now where mom is sort of embarrassing when she comes into school, but my seven year old still thinks I'm awesome. <laughs> so, so I might as well take advantage of it and go be a mom for a while because I can still be a really good project manager after I'm done at school. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, July 15, 2022. So I have been told. This is our weekly summit on neutralizing workplace racism. If we have any folks listening, you are classified as not white. You need to leave work. Pick up your children. Maybe it's an emergency. They, you know, got something happen at school. You got to go pick them up. Nobody gives you the side eye. They don't look at you squirrel. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. It's 405. What are you, 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 that's it for the day? You, hmm, hmm. Right, that, that. You don't have any of that. You say the word, hey. Got to get my children. Oh, yes, indeed. We'll see you tomorrow. Right on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You tell them, hey, something happened with my children. Need to make sure they're straight. They got a half day at school, half day at camp. I was going to take a half day. Matter of fact, I'm going to take a whole day. In fact, when you go to them and tell them the situation, hey, my child's got a half day at camp. Want to be there. Make sure they're straight. Not vegging out the whole day, eating bad food, watching television. Say, hey, take the whole day. You have that sort of work environment. You get all your promotions. You get all your raises. You are compensated correctly. They don't go around bullying you about the COVID-19 vaccine, and they take it seriously. Safe work conditions. They don't come around and pester you with racist jokes. None of that. If you have figured out how to achieve some of this in your work environment on a consistent basis, you should be the first person to dial in. How did you accomplish this? Let us know with lots of detail, hopefully. The number 720-716-7300. The code 564-943. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. One more time. Number is 720-716-7300. Decode 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you you would like to participate. The email until justice at gmail dot com until justice at gmail dot com. We have folks who uh, are maybe concerned by being identified, don't want to have your voice recognized, that sort of thing. Drop us an email. We'll keep it uh, anonymous if you have any tips, suggestions, and certainly if you have any problems or what have you, uh, and you would like some counter-racist logic to kind of help through what is happening in your work environment, uh, see if we can you know, help make sense of it, solve problems without creating new problems. Again, that is always the metric for the workplace and beyond. Uh, quickly, some of the segments that we heard uh, the quick news items uh, so they followed up with the white officers I feel like that's one component that could be deliberate willful white supremacy racism if these were black like 
Hardy's employees. They were going in, Jack in the Box, whatever, White Castle. They going in to make the little sliders and such. And we're not, you know, doing the Rona. Did you hear what uh, they said in Ephesians, verse one? Like what? They would have been fired. It would not have been all this. Well, we've been patient and all the rest of it. The, they would have been fired. Not just we're not doing the vaccine. We're not doing the testing either. And then I suspect all of them using the similar, you know, justification for the, you know, we've got the religion of white supremacy. You know, says we can't do all this. Only individuals classified as white. Again, that, in my view, gets right to the core. What does it mean to be white? And I've said this because it's been so many illustrations of this. They said, see, right there, don't you think Gus T sitting here in Seattle that he missed that? Yes. Seattle all up and down the West Coast, Seattle, uh, Portland, Oregon, and they said uh, New York and some of the other places as well. But I mean, hey, it's been widespread white defiance. The rules do not apply. You don't tell me what to do. You don't boss me. You don't tell me what to put in my body. I said the whole time, hey, I thought enforcement officers, they're supposed to be, you know, the best of the community. You're supposed to be setting an example for the community. That's what I thought. Like, hey, we want to make sure we are conducting ourselves. Hey, this is what we want. Not white defiance, man. You don't you don't tell me what to do. You don't boss me around. This is just some nigger disease anyway. And I stick by what I said. If these were folks in San Diego or anywhere else and they were classified as black, that would have been pointed out. Unruly Negroes in the workplace, jeopardizing our health and safety. Community health and safety, not just in the workplace, because enforcement, they got to go out and put hands. Even in fact, what's the racial classification of the fellow that they hemmed up for smoking a cigarette? Like, come on. Come on. You got that much concern about respiratory problems you're not even getting the the vaccine or the test all that for smoking I get he didn't give out identification and all that in some places that is you know grounds for an arrest or detainment or what have you if you do not identify yourself or give false identification to uh, enforcement officers maybe include that do not lie about your name to enforcement officers don't fabricate. Don't fight. Don't fuss. Don't flee. Do not fabricate about your identity. Uh, we got the segment about the adjustments in the workplace. And I found that fascinating for many reasons. Uh, in fact, the first like 30 seconds of that report from NPR, they spoke with Jack Elliott. Now, they didn't get specific about are you classified as white like we do it here at the cows? They got to the pronouns. Anytime I hear that, I already know like, oh, oh, buckle up. Metaphor, it is about to be something wacky. Like expect all kinds of illogic and confusion. Be prepared. Now they get through this whole wacky segment after Jack, you know, made clear by his pronouns and what he wore to work. Now, I felt like, uh oh, we got some LGBTQ, you know, all the rest of it is coming. So they leave Jack and they go to talk to some of the other folks. Now, they spoke with, uh, it was Frank Ruiz. He said he was told, hey, you really want to, you know, advance in your career. Do something about that last name. He said that his, I think it was his father, it was Francisco. So they had already whitened the name to Frank. And then the last name, take that from Ruiz to Martin, Frank Martin. Now, cousins, Gus T will keep it real with you. This year, July 15 of 2022, as we have been told, if I could just switch up my name, be Gustav Rhodes. 
And I just, boom. white supremacy racism, no longer a problem. Get hired, go to the bank, and they cash your check. They don't ask you all those goofy questions. Do you have a DNA sample, urine sample, fingerprint? Do you have fingernail clippings from your father or other relative? You don't? Oh, you're not going to be able to cash. They don't do all that. They, uh, good evening, Gustav Rhodes. Come right on in. Uh, we don't need that. Your ID is no good. Here, come on. Cash your check immediately. Get you a cup of coffee to boot. Cousins, if I thought for a millisecond that would be possible, you would not have context of white supremacy. You wouldn't have old Gus T. Renegade to kick around and talk about bad and what have you because Gustav Rhodes would be killing it. I don't even know if I'd be doing it. I'd be doing my yoga, Vitamix recipes, out sailing, having a grand old time, and I would never ever, ever talk about white supremacy racism. In fact, if I could do it tomorrow, I would. If I passed any of y'all, retired firefighter, Bay Area mom, non-Clemson grad, any of you, it could be all of you wearing cows t-shirts. Say, hey, Gus. I am Mr. Rhodes. Keep stepping. We went the yoga routine. <laughs> Mr. Rhodes. Keep stepping. Unfortunately, cousins, Gustav Rhodes can't pull that off. Classified as black. Something we point out because we've heard that. In fact, we've heard that a few times. Had to make that point clear. I think that was Dr. Neil Krauss talking about good old Buffalo. Said the so-called Jews and other non-white people there who were not accepted as white early 20th century. They did the same thing. Changed that name over few other things and be accepted as white no more problems you all hang out over there and good luck with Joey and Peyton Gendron and everything else good luck be hanging out with Gustav Rhodes making plans boating trips black get back and it came in the same segment didn't ask for racial classifications they talked to female she said hey I gotta go take care of my children they you know looking at me cross-eyed you leaving at 450? You're leaving at 415? Mm, mm. Not corporate material. Remember that when it's raise time. Remember that when it's promotion time. Now, fortunately, they did say there's been an improvement, I guess, with COVID-19 that now, hey, with all the disruptions and what have you and labor shortages now, just, hey, I got to go get my children. Oh, bravo. Oh, bravo. No problem. No problem. No problem. Which is what it should have been anyway. I mean, if you're a valued employee, like, my goodness. You are a parent first and foremost. That's why I got this kooky job so I can take care of my children. Like, dang, like, I understand they can't disrupt the workplace. We got a business to run and all the rest. But dang, I just got to get my children. I'll be right back. Or she said, I've already done my work. It's not like I'm cutting out at noon and you're not going to see me again for the day. Like, come on. And we've heard lots of that for parents, especially black non-white parents. Zero consideration in the workplace. They continued. Uh, now then, they came back to good old Jack Elliott and said, "Hey, you know, I had to think they had all these folks who thinking and reevaluating their life and what have you. You know, I'm not on all this, you know, binary. You know, I'm non-binary. You know, I like to wear a good pair of overalls. So that's that is non-gender specific." Like I said, you got to expect all the, you already let me know, you start this off talking about what are your pronouns. They don't go into any detail about racism, white supremacy. Now, if I go into work with my overalls on, is that going to help me solve white supremacy racism? I switch up my pronouns. If I'm classified as black, if I'm Chris Rock, I go in there and switch my name up. Is that going to work? Hmm. Incidentally, uh, perhaps if you are white, LGBTQ, and all the rest of it, maybe you can get away. We talked about fashion wardrobe last week. Maybe you can get away with overalls in the workplace. Uh, I'm talking about people who are in a business environment. Certainly, if you are doing construction, carpentry work, maybe architect, architecture, landscaping, that sort of thing, certainly overalls appropriate workplace attire probably a number of other uh, careers that I don't have time to go into 
But if you're in like an office setting, this is a normal nine to five type business setting that they're talking about. I would not wear overalls. We talked about this last week. Uh, things have not gotten that comfortable in the workplace. We are still on the plantation, the system of white supremacy racism. Uh, I don't think you especially, I'd have to say, you as a black male, you're not LGBTQ and all that. You're not confused about your genitalia. He, sir, mister, I do not think you will be looked at like, wow, he's got those slick overalls on. Man, I do not think so. Management material? No way. Where? Same thing I said last week. Wear what you've been wearing before, and even that, prudish. No bright colors and all the rest of it. I wouldn't even wear jeans in the work environment. Like I said, if you work in a business, you have people that are there, they're wearing ties and uh, their blazers and got their heels on and all the rest of it. I would not wear denim at all. Uh, let's see. The segment uh, at the beginning. We heard victim of racism in New Jersey talking about trucking and how even if you're going to be working for yourself, so-called, they can make it difficult for you, right? So they talked about the whole segment, and that's California-specific. They're talking about some of the regulations with regards to uh, truck drivers being independent contractors, and is that going to benefit them, and health insurance, and all the rest. Lots to consider. I thought one point was especially critical in that segment. They were speaking with the white male truck driver and he said that he was talking about benefits and health insurance which is really important and he said hey we don't all start with the same level of knowledge when we come to get in business hugely important point that wasn't even the focus of what they're talking about in the system of white supremacy racism individuals classified as white whether it's trucking or really any business frequently that's going to be one of your major obstacles system of white supremacy generally speaking white people are going to start with a lot more information about trucking or whatever the industry is than you are coming into a business and they generally are the metaphor will be tight lipped they're miserly stingy about sharing that accurate information in a timely manner so that you can flourish in your enterprise that I thought was hugely important and something that really has to be considered everybody starting out of business generally there is an enormous deficit of knowledge between white people non-white people that is something that you have to work compensate for as you work through your business let's see uh, we have people wrote in so I get the emails until justice at gmail.com uh, but there was a report one of my favorite all time subject matters you already know I'm sure folks out there could already guess what he's going to be talking about I should have the uh, cartoon sound effect for racist jokes I've had that for so many years so the Des Monez Register man Pacific North West uh, I think oh this is Iowa I was thinking Idaho so this is not Pacific Northwest Retraction geography is important. Still learning. Uh, so John Deere sued by Des Monez works employee who says he was subjected to racist jokes, threats. People don't know John Deere. They make the tractors and such. Uh, a veteran Iowa employee recently sued John Deere and company alleging that coworkers and supervisors subjected him to racist jokes and threats for years. Johnny Ray Hogan the third, who has worked at John Deere Desmondes works in Acme since 2010 said many employees called him the angry black man and refused to associate with him once he complained about how they treated him according to a lawsuit filed in Polk County District Court in late June he also alleged that his managers scrutinized his work more where have I heard that before John Deere has allowed a culture of racism to flourish and thrive within the Desmonez Works facility. His attorney Roxanne Conlin wrote in the complaint, Johnny Hogan has been insulted, harassed, belittled, humiliated, and excluded, bamboozled, 
all because he is a black male. That's how it is written. Come on with the black Miss Andre, the man not. Dear employees, about a thousand workers at the Acne Factory, best known for its production of sprayers and cotton p- <laughs> Come on, cotton pickers. That's what it says. Lawyers for the company have not filed an answer to the complaint. Uh, according to the lawsuit, a co-worker gave Hogan the nickname the angry black man in 2019 now how is that a nickname sparky speedy skipper the angry black dude (laughs) what in the world the angry black dude they have like the goofy white woman? Do they have anything like that there? The no count white man? Do they have that title? The shiftless white fella? Do they have anything like that? Just the angry black dude. Black male privilege. Yes, yes. He said uh, the name, uh, 2019, the name stuck with other workers and supervisors allegedly using it during meetings come on now come on now (laughs) we're in trying to do the conference this year our estimates for cotton pickers (laughs) excuse me I'm sorry inside joke inside joke let's get it right All right. Uh, our estimates this year for the cotton pickers Uh, let's see angry black man what do you think cotton pickers what do you think Come on. <laughs> if 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 I wasn't angry before, man. In the men, they said supervisors. Plural. Like this is widespread. The CEO, the janitor, custodian, everybody comes. Angry black dude, what's going, my brother? What's going? Don't shoot us up today. Like what in the world? Now, if I was more confused about white supremacy racism, hey, just trying, or hey, maybe even go in through that Brentle James man, still upset about it, and just ride along with it. <laughs> That's right. Arr, angry, if I, arr, I'll bite everybody. Arr, me and Mike Tyson. Now, you want to tell me, how does that become company wide in 2019? They didn't say. They didn't pull an old Alice Siebel. Like, what do you mean racism? I didn't. I didn't know nothing about no stereotype about angry Negroes. I ain't heard nothing about that. You can't. I mean, really, in 2009, even in Iowa, we've had guests on the program from Iowa. 2019, and say that's after Charlottesville and all that. Heather Hair and all the rest of it. Angry black dude. Yes, that will be your nickname. Yes, but I'm ignorant about. Racism, white supremacy. That's one of those. Now, if you're codified, you work a job and they do something like that. I want everything recorded. Oh, gold. Please let them send out the email. Angry black dude. Text messages. Angry black dude. All of it. Can we get transcripts of the meetings, please? Read back from uh, twelve fifteen p.m. Cotton pickers, angry black. Thank you. Get all that. Yes, thank you. Pile up weeks, months. Cotton pickers, angry black dude, angry black dude, angry black dude. Then tell me, yeah, I had a great work, and and, and like I said, I would be looking. Do they have shiftless white woman? No count white fella. Do they have any of those type of nicknames? Because that's not exactly like a with like a flattering nickname. That's not something where I would feel good about and poke my chest out every time they say it. So did they have that sort of like disparaging nickname for anybody really? Any other employees there? I wouldn't even get into the what exactly about me makes you think I'm angry enough that this needs to be a part of my name and how I'm identified. Have I smacked anybody here? Broke a chair? 
punched a wall, raped somebody. Give me the list. What did I, what have I done? Yelling obscenities. Break it down for me. Black male, that's what they tell me. Black male privilege. Bucket loads of it, heaps of it, dump trucks of it. Anywho, think about that one next time you go to get your John Deere cotton picker. (laughs) Anywho, uh, we'll get to the emails and, you know, all that jazz. Uh, the email address again is untiljustice at gmail dot com. The number is seven two zero seven one six seven three hundred. The code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate see what type of angry black dudes and dudettes we have hanging out on the line here uh, first few folks who dialed in with a hand up line should be open angry black dudes that was it. angry black trucker driver yes we can hear you <laughs> let's go uh, greetings uh, guys uh, listening callers um, I got a report so uh, it kind of ties in with the book club so um I've been working in uh, upstate New York uh, for, like, the past, since, like, April. So I came up here um, toward, like, the end of April, and um, they had me, like, in the upper northern Pennsylvania area and close to upstate New York, but not quite, but still doing some work in between. And then this last time they sent me up to New York was two weeks after the shooting. So anywhere kind of like in New York State, I pretty much like I've I've been there to um oh man I, I let me just get to my report so um I was in Buffalo so I was like let me just um you know go past by the the area to see you know I I just wanted to just really kind of see and just like get a visual look at it just from following along in a book club. And when, and I mean, like, (laughs) soon as you, like, get to, uh, where, um, like, right off of, it's all like Highway 33 or something to go off into the, I mean, it's like right there, boom. Nothing but black people. I mean, like, black people hanging outside. I mean, I'm from New Orleans, so it looked like, like, the Night Ward, uh, Magnolia Project. It looks like that. I mean, like, it, it, they don't give you no introduction. They don't give you no kind of like, hey, let me just ride a couple blocks. I mean, it's like right there. And the minute I got in that neighborhood, I just automatically thought of that book club and I thought about, uh, um, uh, Peyton, Peyton Gentry. And I was like, this bastard knew exactly what he wanted to do. Because it was just like, I mean, like, you know, black people were just out there just hanging. Like he knew exactly, like, I, it was just, it was like, I, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. So, um, ironically, when I got there, um, they actually had some type of news con- news press conference um, out there um, with the American flag and everything. But by me being in the truck, the police, he wouldn't let me leave the truck because the streets are so narrow. The truck was literally taken up like, you know, like the middle of the street, um, almost you know, um, to what, like it was blocking the street off. So it was, so he was like, no, you can't go through the press conference. You just have to kind of stay right here on the corner. So I was able to take pictures of the victim, you know, uh, kind of memorial on the corner. And, uh, at that time they actually had the store closed. So I thought they were going to close the store down, but I just read a news article, um, yesterday, um, from the Houston website saying they're going to reopen tops up in two months. So that was kind of, that's kind of strange just hearing the um, compensatory calling with the young lady who was having all the mental stress. It's like, well, damn, if she's going through that, now you're going to open the store back up just, you know, like in two months. Like that's, that's kind of weird to me. But um, I was at a truck stop in uh, Waterloo, New York. That's like one of those small towns. And um, 
What did you say? What did, what did, you, what did you say we call it? Sundown? Well, not you, not we, but like another name for Sundown Town? Racially Restricted Regions. Okay. So upstate New York is full of that. I mean, and they've done like an outstanding job of warehousing black people in certain areas only in the like kind of bigger cities. So like in Rochester, Buffalo, Albany, New York, Syracuse, like all, all the, they have all the black people like in one section because the cities are not, you know, as big as like a New York city or Miami, Florida, their warehouse is just this one section. And each city you go to outside of that is just nothing but these racially restricted areas. So I'm in a truck stop talking to a non-white female um, who mother is white and her dad is black. And this white lady, you know, I'm getting my coffee. This white lady comes up just out of the, out of nowhere and just says, uh, hey, sugar, um, give me something sweet. And I've never seen this white woman a day in my life. So I got I have a code to where if, if a white person, even a non-white person, just come up just talking silly, I just look at them. So whatever look, I don't know what the look look like, but I just look at them. And the non-white victim female who I was talking to, she just bust out laughing and just walked up. I was like, well, first thing I thought was delectable the Negro. I'm like, well, I mean, even <laughs> that's the first thing you could think of. Hey, sugar, what's, what's sweet or whatever she said. And then there's another, so what I've, what I've noticed by being out there is that if, when you in these small towns, if you see a black person nine times out of ten, they're in a tragic arrangement. And nine times out of ten, the, the, it's a black male with a white female. It's not too many white females with black males. And I was in a town called Oswego, New York, which is, really, really up north, New York, maybe about an hour and a half outside of Rochester. And I just, I, I was just riding along, and I seen this little white kid, he made, made about 11, year old, 11 years old, in the yard with a, like, with a shotgun. And he's twirling it around in his hand and doing all these poses and stuff like, like I guess he practicing for ROTC, but this was a real... This was a shotgun. Like, this wasn't no play gun. Because normally, if you see someone that's an ROTC, they might have the gun wrapped up or it might be white or something like that. It looks plastic. But this was a real gun. And I mean, he's twirling it around like a sword, dropping down on one knee, aiming it. I'm like, I'm passing. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I said, let me put my foot on the gas and just keep moving. I, no stopping at all. And then um, the, air, the 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 main location that we was working out of uh, is Albany, New York. And so everywhere everywhere I go and everywhere I deliver, everywhere I work at, I work out of, I'm literally the only black person there. Like the only black person there. So what I do is, you know, I just you know put my head down, do my thing. And I go outside, like, because um, when we when we get in our load or whatever, we get in our assignment for the day, everybody kind of, like, compact in a small office. So the office is kind of, like, small. So the minute I get my get my load or whatever like that, I'm, I'm going to sit outside. Like, I ain't wasting no time. But this particular time, I had to walk back inside, and all the white guys was in there, like, talking and chatting. And the minute I walked in there, they just shut up. I'm like, all right, so they must be talking, <laughs> talking about the nigger outside. So... They was talking, and the main thing, the, 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 the key word, they kept using the word welfare. Welfare. All these welfare recipients, they just taking up everything. These welfare recipients, they just all over these welfare recipients. So I, I just kind of jumped in, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't really, I didn't get, you know, I just asked a question. I was like, when you say welfare, like, like who you know, who are you talking about? And uh, he was like, no, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a, like, uh, the the um the the U.S. government is just spending so much, like spending fifty percent of their money on on welfare and, and this that and that. I'm like, okay, but you still answer my question. So I'm like, I said, well, um, I said, well, where the other fifty percent going? If you don't mind me asking, I said, I don't really know too much about politics. I said, so where the other fifty percent of the budget going? 
Uh, I say because aren't they sending money to like Ukraine and stuff like that? Oh, well, it, it's going to other miscellaneous stuff in um, construction and on the highways and stuff like that. I like so the majority of the money going to the welfare people. And they say, yeah, man, because uh, during the, the pandemic, you know, these guys are pulling up in, in Benzes with gold chains on. I'm like, I'm like, I say, I asked again, I say, but who are you talking about? Like, who are you talking about? Like, I say, it's a, maybe they got caught up in the pandemic. Maybe they lost their job. Like, the minute they got the car, like, you don't know. I'm just saying, man, why would you go out and get something like that? Like, you still ain't answering my question. All right. So, they was, um, another day passed, they was listening to this, uh, this radio station it's like 103.1 or 103.3 something is in albany so this radio station this is where you know they doing like the dj he's just like doing all this racist commentary they cracking racist jokes and i'm sitting in there because i was in there by myself at first but then all the guys they just started coming in well this is one guy he, you know, they was, you know, he came in and another guy came in, but the other guy he left. But this one particular guy, I think his name was, like, I don't want to say his name. Well, I think his name was Steve. Like, right? and um, he would always like every time you doing a low, he would do something to always mess the pump up. Like, with some strange, oh man, I'm, uh, I, I clicked on your, I clicked on your low and then I messed the pump up. Sorry, man, I had to turn it, turn it off. I'm like, this every time though, it's only you. But we, he was listening to this radio station, and um, they must they had an event or something in New Orleans where um, the mayor or something like that got into like some type of altercation in the bathroom. So the DJ was mimicking um, Mayor Mayor Trail in New Orleans, like yeah, y'all, such and such, such and such. And I'm like, so I take I was able to take like 16 seconds of it, but the whole time in there, I'm kind of smirking and laughing because it was kind of funny. So. When he walked out, I was able to get about 15 seconds of it. As soon as I came in, he, he hurried up and, um, like, he saw me smirk. He hurried up and ran and turned it off. I was like, why he turned it off? He's like, oh, man, I wanted to listen to some music. I'm like, oh, man. But it was, it was, I, <laughs> I was like, dang. I was like, this must be, like, like all with, like, the channel with all the racist jokes because when he saw me smirk, he didn't turn it off until he saw me smirking. And I was like, damn, I was like, man, if I wish I could have caught it, like, the whole thing, I would have definitely emailed it to you. And um, there's one more thing. Oh, yeah, I was <laughs> I was in another small town, like, using the restroom at this gas station because uh, normally I don't use the restroom until I get back to the job site. That way I know I got a chance of not being, you know, messed with at the job site, like, you know. So, But I had to go real bad. And, man, you know, I was in the stall, man, it, um, and I walked into this little bitty gas station, and luckily the bathroom was right there as soon as you walk in the store. So the store is all white, like all these older white guys, they're sitting at the table doing their breakfast and stuff like that. So I'm in the stall. And, uh, man, tell me why they come in there and start cutting the lights off, flickering with the lights. So I'm like, oh, man. But I, had, <laughs> I had my phone with me, so I immediately uh, text my, uh, my attempted spouse. I'm like, and I dropped my location. I'm like, man, this is the last place I was at. If, if if you don't hear from me at all, like, this is the last place I was at. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> I was like, man, I got to get the hell up out of here. But other than that, it's, it's been okay. Uh, now they got me out here in Iowa. So <laughs> now I got more to learn and probably have another report maybe like another week or so. But I, I'll end my line at right there. I'll mute my line. Iowa, hey, that's that's. Uh, I just read the report. That's where they were having the John Deere, calling my man the the angry black dude at the John Deere out in Iowa. So that's hey, put that in the in the research hopper as well. Uh, if you get to the town, I have to see if I get the exact location there. You when you got to go to all these locations in upstate New York and what have you, did you get close to Conklin? I know that's a little bit further west. Yeah, it's um actually outside of um Binghamton. Binghamton, um, New York. Um and that was another thing that I noticed. I'm like, um and I was just kinda like going through, you know, while I'm riding along, just kinda going through everything and I was thinking about this guy, Peyton Gentry, and I'm like, he couldn't go to Binghamton Binghamton because it was too close. And he couldn't go to Syracuse because that was you know, that wasn't too far from Conklin neither. And he, he, I'm telling you, he studied that Joey 22. He studied it. He knew about it. 
And it's kind of strange that the professors who teach at Buffalo and other people don't know about this, about that case, but he had to have studied that case because I'm not even exaggerating, Gus. I actually was going to the Whole Foods to get me some groceries, and that's what made me say, man, let me go check. Let me uh, let me go just, you know, check out Jefferson and see, because I was on Jefferson and Riley. And, um, I mean, the Whole Foods was like five miles away from – um, the, um, from the tops, but you went down about two. You went down about two blocks, and I mean, like immediately, you knew you was in a, a non-white black area. I know, I, I know, I kind of deviated from your question. I hope I answered your question, but I. It's just when you read, when you listen to the book club, and you actually up here, it's just like, damn, it, it's. It's it's a lot, man. <laughs> it's a lot, and you see in these places, it's it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, but you know, like you say, we still learning, and man, <laughs> I'm learning a lot, <laughs> a lot, lot. Context of white supremacy, still learning. I uh, see. That's why Gus T in making my compensatory investment request. I want to go to Buffalo where I can have time to. Hang out. Let me go hang out. Let's see what Jefferson and all that. Matter of fact, the store reopened today. Like we'll talk about that tomorrow in the wow. call in. But they and they had protests. They had people who said the same thing you did. Like what in the world? You had all of this carnage. Like you tore down the school at Sandy Hook and some of these. I think the uh, school in Florida where they had the shooting. I think got tore down as well. I have to go back to verify that. But I know Sandy Hook. They tore it down. Uh, and they said, why in the world uh, are we going to open this place back up? They even had some black people coming out saying, I get it. We're in a so-called food. Five miles, if you don't have a car, is a long distance to Whole Foods. I get it. And they said the same thing. But, dang, this is where I got to go to get my groceries now to go back in. Oh, yes. Hmm. context of what with tomorrow we'll hear more details you get to hear all of the you know why they reopened and i mean two months and again this tops is like a 7-eleven that's what they said that's the way they described it like a big 7-eleven not whole foods at all anywho uh book club absolute madness incredible and buffalo in general we'll be talking about that tomorrow the store reopening um with the he said he saw the white driving all these spots and that's in James Lowen James Lowen's book incorrectly titled Sundown Town should be racially restricted regions but he said that most of these are in so called northern locations New York, Michigan, Illinois blah blah blah, Wisconsin uh, but he said that you would have black people, they could come to like a New York City you know, Michigan or excuse me, a, a, a Chicago Detroit, something like that, but you're not just going to be everywhere. You're not going to be in Waterloo. Some of these are like, no way. That's how you end up with Conklin and all these other spots. He said he saw that young white boy out in the yard. He was going through his full drill, had his rifle and twirling all that. Hey, and we just read that. For two months we've been reading that. That's Joey hunting with his father, talked about all his guns. Peyton Gendron, 18. Matter of fact, we just talked about that last week, July 4th. Also, racially restricted region, Highland Park, Illinois. Same thing, had his guns. Cremo the third had his guns. Dad helped him get That is white culture. He wasn't just practicing idly. He was practicing for you. Me. That's Joey 22. That's what we're reading about right there. New Orleans, hey, looters, got to be prepared. Negroes might get out of pocket, you know. That right, that would have been all that. He said the intelligent thing. He didn't say, I slowed down to investigate. Ask the young fella questions. Drop him off a snack. He said, I got out of there quickly. Bravo. He said he went to the... Despite, in fact, before all that, he said, hey, the code normally is I wait and use the bathroom, bathroom, restroom when I get back to my work facility. 
minimize the likelihood of me being harassed. Not that my coworkers might not pull something, but, you know, hey, sometimes nature calls. He goes to the bathroom. They come in and are playing with the lights. Now, it's a couple ways I could take that. I mean, now, hey, how old are we? I thought that's what you did, like, elementary school? Giggle and run. Oh, I turned the light off and he's in the bathroom. <laughs> that's like nine years old. But what I was really thinking, that book that he just said, Delectable Negro, he's in there fiddling with his genitals. We got to go harass him. Why? And again, this is why I keep saying this. I'm too ignorant. I didn't even think of this. This was a child. I think he was like six. Might have even been five. Like really, no older than six. He said, you know, Gustav, I know a lot of non-white people, my parents, family. I got sisters and all that. You, (laughs) like, uh, I don't know any non-white people who just, they sit around and think about harming people. I don't know any non-white people that do that. White people do this all the time. Their brain must be different than ours. Well, going to bed. Night, Gustav. I was all struck. Now, again, some of this, you got to be honest with your children. You talk to them honestly, hey, they will chat it up and can amaze you if you just talk to them honestly. Man, do we think like that? Now, anybody here that is over what I just said, eight, nine, so anybody here that's over the age of 10, you see a white woman, white man, white child go to use the lavatory. Do you have a thought? Ooh, I'm going to go, ooh, let's go turn the light on. Let's go bang on the stall. Oh, that'll be so fun. Who thinks that do we have anybody here in the last 10 years that's been in your brain computer? You're not even in the bathroom. You're out chilling, doing whatever, working, eating a meal. I don't know. Eat a cup of coffee. Racist jokes, complaining about welfare. You see a stranger go in the bathroom and your thought is, let's go in and harass him. That is not Gus T. Particularly for a strap. I mean, maybe if you work together and you all, you know, horseplay in the workplace, as they say. But a straight, you don't know if this person has a gun. Has he got medical issues? Like, eh. Anyway, great code. Try to avoid using the bathroom out in these public locations if you can. Uh, when he said the white woman, the other delectable Negro, she goes, mmm, sugar, mmm. Wow, now, some of that could have even been the racism, white supremacy. He said he was talking to a black female at the time. It could have just been like, oh, man, these niggers are getting along, being amicable, maybe even constructive. See if I can disrupt that, break that up, get in there. Because white people do that all the time, especially in the workplace. They see some black people being constructive. Let me hop in your conversation. What are y'all talking about? Disrupt all that. Y'all aren't supposed to be getting along anyway. And then all that, like, yeah, I'm going to interrupt and want some sexual attention from this black male. Nothing to say at all. Uh, and question lane, I guess that'll be my last point. The He said he, he guess the work, the white people that he actually works with, suspected racist too. He said they were in the room wherever at the workplace. He walked in. They had been talking. Ah, <laughs> no go <whatever. laughs> He walked in. And, Angry black male has entered. <laughs> I'm all, we've heard that one so many times. Individuals classified as black have said they've been in a work environment. They walk where everybody had been having a jovial time. And <laughs> oh, Bob, Bob, oh, Bob, you're killing me. They walk in. Huh. Evening. Evening. <laughs> like, what, did, what What? y'all talking about? What? Y'all, y'all talking about the niggers? What? Oh. Then he gets in the question lane, which is the best. Like, oh, who, who, who exactly are you talking about that's doing all this welfare theft? 
don't answer the question. I know that's the first thing that I did when the Rona hit. Got myself five gold chains and a Benz. That's what all the colored folks that I know, that's what they did. 50% of the, but they don't even like, are you serious? Where did you get this information? Not that I would ask all those questions, but I mean like, wow, just make up anything. 50% of it is on Negro welfare moochers getting gold chains and Benzes to smoke crack cocaine and chase white women. Hmm. Hmm. Alrighty. And again now, ignorant about racism, white supremacy. Speaking of ignorant, I guess this will be my last one. I too, at minimum, find it suspicious, and that's not even strong enough. How in the world are you a professor at the University of Buffalo writing books on racism in Buffalo? You don't know about this case. And for that to be a pattern, I will continue to ponder on that one too, still learning. Uh, much obliged, uh, our trucker in Houston, angry black male. Um, we'll wait on the update, I guess, in a few weeks. Uh, other folks, the number again, 720-716-7300, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. He also thought Mr. Gendron knew about this case. You study racism and serial killers, especially if you're going to go to Buffalo and you're in New York State. I don't know. I guess a lot of other white people have missed this case. So I mean, I guess, but man, I said from the beginning, if he did his homework, I would think he knew about this case. Keep that one in the hopper for the trial. Other folks who dialed in with a hand up, proceed. Can I be heard? Bay Area Mom? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh um, greetings to you and everyone on the line. Um, I wanted, I wanted to know what state, what station was that that they were listening to the radio station? Um, or what was it that what state was it or city or whatever? The gentleman that just spoke and it had all the the racist jokes that he turned off because he didn't want him to hear. Let's see. Our trucker uh, in Houston. What was the radio station? Uh, it's like uh, 103.3 in like Albany, New York, or 103.1, something like that. Uh, it's in Albany, New York. Okay, okay I'm gonna look it up. Okay. And the guy, the uh, the host. Okay. I'm sorry, the host. He comes on at like, I think from like three to five, or four to six, something like that. Four in the evening to Eastern time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, so the police officers that um, didn't want to get vaccinated um, and had the right to not get vaccinated, keep their job, not get demand also to not get tested. And I've never seen an officer very religious until now. I know, I get it with the religion of white supremacy, but it just shows that that's the religion. And then you pull out all these quotes of the Bible. I know what um, what it is as far as that whole long, it's like two pages, or, it's lots of, lots of words defining how and why and what is in it and how it's against uh, all these different um, verses in the Bible. And if that, we're very spiritual black people. We're very religious. We fill the churches up, overload them. We blast how you to blast, 
highly favored. We're real good with that. But if we were to pull that, it would be a law against that instantly. They would have that instantly, and they would have shamed us out of our religion. So I just thought that was interesting. And it still stands. If I could, I stand by my word. So <laughs> they still uh, still don't have to do it yet. So um, I thought that was great. That's, that's interesting. And you're giving people, you're all in somebody's face with no mask. You can give somebody COVID? That's crazy. Um, okay, so my workplace racism. Um, this is the last week of summer school. Today was the last day. <clears throat> um, I, uh, the, they ran the black man off. He left early today. Um, <laughs> they, they, they were very rude and discourteous to him ever since he stepped in for the lady that quit. Um, he stand, he stood his, you know, uh, ground, so to speak, um, as far as not backing down. He was always very, uh, asked a lot of questions about what was going on. <laughs> he asked so many questions that the instructor got mad at him and said, don't you put me on, ask me, question my teaching in front of everybody, you just wait and pull me to the side. And then she basically, uh, she was so mad from that. Because I don't know what happened because I try to leave out. So I don't have to get involved. And so I'll take one of the uh, children of the girl with the uh, cerebral palsy. She's always the one trying to go out the door. And um, God forbid if she goes anywhere near the door, you're not doing your job. Now there's four adults. Teacher doesn't want to do any uh, of the labor. She wants to us to do the labor. Um, so with that, the white lady wants us to do the, the actual labor, the footwork, and she looks like she's doing all the teaching. So um, I, I, I noticed. So um, they're, they're always arguing with the black male, always. He's a uh, heavily melanated, tall, dreadlocked. Black male. So, um, uh, it's another uh, guy. Looks like he could be. I don't know. He's not white though. Another guy that he hangs out like at lunch. They come out. He comes out with us, and so they talk. And he, we're we're fine. We don't have a problem. I I just watch the children while they eat. He'll help watch them. But the white lady comes and brings the girl with the cerebral palsy out. Instead of waiting for me to come in to go chase the little girl, she brings her outside to me so to come get me, to stop me from whatever I'm doing to go and help her change this little girl. And then I guess that's also the calling to say that it's time for me to come in, time for us to come in. They've been out too long. Now, mind you, before the lady quit, when she was the one outside uh, with us, feeding the little the boy in the wheelchair, we could stay out till almost noon. We were waiting on the uh, Asian young man to finish eating his uh his lunch and he brings it from home and he takes small morsel bites. So it takes a long so that's what we were waiting for. So it takes a long a, a, a while for us all to come in. It's fine when she's out there, but when she's not out there Oh, it's taking us so long. They should be in here by now. We're going to miss our lesson that no one's paying attention to. There's no one. The lesson isn't geared towards them being engaged in. They're more, they're just repeating a lot of stuff. One little girl memorizes. She has a great memory, so she memorizes a lot of the stuff so she can, you know, get some of the lessons, but she doesn't, she doesn't mean anything to her. So, um, the, the white lady, she's, uh, I, I just tune her out. I, I just, I don't even look at her. I just tune her out. Um, my, the BCBA came in, uh, to visit with the class and, um, this week. And so, as soon as she walked in the door, they put on their acting. Oh, come here, little fellow, Bobby girl. Come here, let me get it. Oh, she's so sweet. Come here, let's do our work. Let's do our work. And, um, the other, uh, the whole class is out of control. Uh, 
um, because I'm not inside. I had went outside. So uh, then um, the guy in the wheelchair, oh, God, come here. You want to do some this? You want to do that? Normally, he's kind of ignored until you just have to acknowledge him, like, since the black male's been calling out discrimination and uh, mistreatment and not including certain kids. She's all she now she'll say, and I am including everybody. I'm not discriminating against nobody. Since people are complaining that I am discriminating against everybody, and I'm not being equal, so she has <laughs> got to that. So um, she thought she's very she to do all that in between lessons just to show that she's doing her job. So she says, or not doing what he said. So she's talking to me from that. She's realizing that she told the guy, look, I've been working for 15 years. And he's like, I got, I got, I, I'm smart. I got degrees. So he just keeps <laughs> saying stuff. I know stuff. I'm going to school for this. You're a, you're a, what do they call a paraeducator? You're, a, you're just a paraeducator and you paraeducators talking to me. And so you guys, you're a paraeducator. So here go the white lady. And I've been doing this. No, Mama, keep in mind, nobody's ever talking to her. But she's always talking. I've been doing that, working with her for four years, so I know everything she needs. And so then, uh, the, you know, yeah, and um, so I've been, I've been teaching for 15 years, and you, I will, let me tell you something. I'm not going to ever listen to you, okay? I, I, don't, I don't care what, I don't care. I'm never going to listen to you. I, I'm not listening. I don't care if you tell the principal. I don't care who you tell. I'm not listening to you. And um, you don't correct me and what I'm doing in front of anybody. You put me to the start. And so here you go, the white lady. And um, I've been uh, doing working with special needs kids for 20 years. And so uh, the guy, he said something, but I'm such and such. And I take such and such because they're just going back and forth. And I just don't think you're you're doing this correctly. You're not doing this. And so they just are. It's just, now mind you, we're in class. We're not outside. We're in class. In the middle of a lesson. So, um, I, I don't get in it. I don't. Then, so ask us, huh? Am I wrong? So he'll ask me, and he's wrong. And I said, no, you're not. No, you're not wrong. So, um, this is the tension. Um, even with, uh, we're, we've never been trained to change, um, <clears throat> the boy in the wheelchair, but we still have to do it and have to do it quick. Hurry up, hurry up. Little boy got a new wheelchair. It's all, oh, my stars. It's something, before he had a pillow in between his legs uh, to keep his legs from locking uh, because of whatever his condition is. He, his, um, his, but he doesn't look like he gets a lot of arm and leg movement. Um, so his legs kind of tighten up. Um, and I'm sure it hurts, too. Um so he has a new wheelchair that has straps that separate his legs, and it's a whole lot of Velcro and, oh, dear, buckles and a lot of stuff. So it takes me a while to do it. I ha- I go with the black male when we do change him, not knowing what to do, but I was told that the teachers, some of the teachers don't use the Hoyer lift. They just lift them. So what I started doing was lifting them because I don't know. I don't want to know how to use a Hoyer lift. So, um... I lift them, we get them on there, I gently change them. He gets stressed out because I'm sure whoever changed, however it works, they're not, I don't know, but he's, he's tight. It, it's tight and it hurts and whatever else he's got going on. Sure, he's had surgery. He doesn't cough, so sometimes he whines. So we found a pacifier in his chair. So apparently he's like 15, 16. He, they give him this pacifier to soothe him for whatever reason. So I don't know how changing it is at home or anywhere else. So he has a pacifier. So the black guy gave the girl to do the pacifier. And he just instantly, mm, oh, snap, okay, well, whatever. So he, <laughs> he kept the pacifier in his mouth. So he, um, I have to get it. It takes a long time. Oh, my God. It takes a long time. And then remembering, because this is a new wheelchair, is that enough with the pillow and trying to figure out which way the pillow and how it ties and all this foolishness? This super-duper-duper uh, wheelchair has a lot of straps and buckles and 
crisscross toes and under the arm buckles. Oh dear. So yesterday we're coming back to teachers in the hall, like gonna come look for us. And mind you, also we gotta go halfway across the world and outside to change him every day. And yesterday wasn't my day, it was a white lady's day. But she said, I can't do it. And so the uh <laughs> yeah, remember I told you that we got to be flexible by sometimes it's the subject to change the schedule. I said, all right, it's all good. I was like, it's good because he don't like you anyway. He's so rough. He don't want you changing him anyway. I'm not going to be this way. But so what time are you going to change it? Never asked me in my life what time I was going to change it until that day when it was a switch of roof. So anyway, he, we come back, and the teacher's in the hall. Where was taking you so long? Where was you at? What was you doing? What was taking you so long? I mean, what did it take too long? It take over 30 minutes. It doesn't take that long. It's, I'm like, what? What was you doing? I said, well, if you can give me a minute to answer, if, if I may. Can I answer? Okay, what was you doing? You take taking so long. I said, I look like, I don't mess around or play games. There is nothing to do here. I do what I have to do. If it takes long, that's what it took. I don't know what you thought. I was like, look at all this. This is this, this mess with this, all these straps and stuff. I was like, so you're not going to check me about what time I come back from doing what I have to do. When I'm finished, I'm here. But I'm not playing games. So she, she going to say, well, when his father was here, you should have asked about how, his daddy, nothing about this. Oh, no. Wheelchair? You just gonna leave me alone? So, and she said something, and I'm like, "This is just it's very frustrating." I know, I know, I know. If you, we got one, one more day, one more day, we got one more day. I was like, "This is crazy." So, after they done ran that black man off this morning, I gotta go through the changes with the white lady. I've never changed him with her. With, with her. So. I'm already not talking and speaking. It's, it's, it's over. So I just do what I got to do and go. Um, we don't really have to talk. You know, you give me instruction. No problem. I'm, no problem. Okay, got it. Mm, thumbs up. Going about my business. So now the girl, the white lady. Did you see how he was trying to, um, not just tune him out. Well, did you, and yeah, it was, it, it, did you see um, how he was just trying to say that uh, we should, uh, what is some mess. So she, they were just talking about him behind his back about what he was saying about um, including the kids. And I just wasn't listening. I'll just leave out. So now the white lady is saying, uh, well, um, what, what? I said, hey, so since you ain't doing nothing, let's go change this boy. Okay, which one? This We're going to change him first and do the other with the little girl on her way out because there's a little party out there for the day for the kids that those two didn't get to go to the one that were getting changed. They didn't get to go to the participation party. So um, we go change the boy. So now she's trying to talk. Oh, goodness. Just like how the guy, did you know how the guy was trying to argue about, um, about uh, whatever she was saying. I don't know because I wasn't listening. I wasn't answering. And she just kept talking. And then I just wouldn't answer her. And um, we walked all the way to the bathroom. She's like, yeah, because I just figured, you know, I, I'd help you change her. And I wasn't answering. And uh, then she started talking about other teachers and um, how they, uh, like, uh, with the little girl, yeah, uh, someone, the teacher was just telling me when I was out there that they, they, they would let her just cry. She would just cry, cry, cry a lot. And um, I'm just not saying anything because I'm thinking she's thinking that I'm more than just a paraeducator now. So now she's saying other things, so I'm not answering. So when we get in the bathroom, I said, all right, so are you going, since you do it how you do it, you just do what you do and just tell me what you need me to do. So I use this, and now she's doing this whole drawn-out explanation that should have happened four weeks ago. I have to care less how this thing works. And then she's going step by step. You see this? And all these words is like 7,000 words in stereo. And I'm just, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. 
So she didn't know how to get the straps. So the straps was hard, getting off, pulling them out, all that stuff was hard. So then the test was going to say, now I see what was taking you guys so long in the bathroom. I was like, man, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that four weeks later. I don't want to hear that. And so <laughs> she's just so happy. We do it all this, and it was it was hard. It was a lot of work. It was hard. It was even harder getting the back end. And I said, like, just give me a minute because I got to figure this out. And then she's like, wow, and it does. It is a lot. Now I get why. I'm going to tell the teacher why. I just didn't say anything else. So um, when we pushed them back to class, she was uh, she was pushing me. Uh, she was pushing pushing them back to class. She's gonna say. What school had, were you at before? When I was at all these schools, I worked for the behavioralist. She said, oh, yeah, dummy, idiot. So um, I had to send an email of what had happened throughout the whole uh, week to the principal, both principals, the actual principal and the summer school principal, because regardless, that is not, um, professional conduct. No one should have to endure that kind of abuse. How do you run off uh, a people assisting you? How do you run off? Who do you think you are to even communicate with someone in these classes? So I sent this in an email. The principal told me today she got my email. I know you got my email. I sent it. And she said and she started it to the, uh, the, the uh, head of um, the special education department as well. So um, like I said, I don't I always have my resume updated because I participate in the program, so I can care less uh, if I'm there or not. But while I'm there, you're not going to communicate with me like that. You're not going to run everybody off like that so you can continue to run this the way you do and the children don't get the adequate help that they need. So um, with that, I will mute my line, and thank you for um, allowing me to speak. Angry Black Bay Area Mom, much obliged for, uh, mm, 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 mm. Uh, I, I feel like I've said it a few times, like, man, if this is the way that they treat and talk to staff, and these are supposed to be like the staff that's working with special needs, children, that sort of thing, <clears throat> wow. Patience? Yeah. Very short supply, gentle, soothing tone, de escalation. Yeah. 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 Even training, put that one in there like, man, like, uh, these are special needs children. And you got to go through all of this, and they've got, you know, special lifts. He said the Hoyer lift and all this, like, why isn't adequate training like top priority? That's some, this seems like something that's really important. Safety. Child safety, I mean. Hey, children with special needs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, incidentally, uh, I would not. She was talking about the black males, you know, talking about, you know, what he's studied and accomplished and all that academically or career wise, I would not, um, list off whatever you think your qualifications are when talking to a white person or a non-white person, really. Um, if you're still a Negro, uh, I wouldn't care if you have the greatest qualifications and resume in the history of resumes, you're still a Negro. So, yeah, I would just question Lane and whatever problem we're trying to address. I would not try and impress upon anyone how much knowledge, information, how much skill, expertise that I have. Um, the not, I do think not fussing publicly, I do think that that is a great um, part of codification. Um, if you're a supervisor, even if you're not, even if you just have to address something with a coworker, excuse me, a coworker, and <clears throat> it, it might not even be a a critique 
or what have you, but addressing something that's not going to be a compliment and what have you. I think it's always best. Everybody has an ego uh, to do that sort of thing privately, especially, you know, in a school environment, not in front of the class. We've heard lots of examples of that um, to pull the person aside and, and like gentle patience, calm, that sort of thing. I feel like that can be the best way. But, yeah, definitely should not be any sort of public reprimanding happening. That definitely, in, especially in front of the children, like, yikes, what is going on? Um, the All of the, like, petty discretion, uh, around everything, really, you know, how long is it going to take you all in the bathroom? And, you know, y'all can't have all that time for recess. Like, just the petty tyranny uh at racists and even a lot of victims get in this you know just bossing people around and all that if she says some days if the lady is outside they do recess the little fellow wants to take time to eat his lunch no problem if she's not outside hey gotta go lesson plans to get to chop chop let's go that sort of thing even the bathroom now again these are special needs children everybody has seen that it's not like you know this is a surprise why i mean what is this stopwatch thing how long is it supposed to take in the restroom with a special needs child? And she said, what do you think I'm doing? I mean, you're texting, watching Netflix on my phone. Break it down for me. All that. See, like we heard that one before. Like got people on the stopwatch about the bathroom. Like, good Lord. I didn't know. How long do we, is it supposed to take? Two minutes, three minutes, let me know. Jesus, then uh, let's see. Even the summer school being over with, like, dang, July 4th was last week, and she said summer session is over. Like, dang, then they might have other sessions, you know, between now and, I guess, September or whatever. But, man, if these are special needs children, why aren't they getting like extra extra help you know all the resources possible to try to get them back up compensate for whatever deficiencies they may have Meh. the training component I, I cannot you know emphasize enough because we hear that all the time like weekly non-white people being put sometimes in not just unsafe like just you know flagrantly dangerous environments no training dangerous for you dangerous for the children or the clients or what have you that sort of thing is so standing you really i think have to be extremely vocal because i mean something happens can you imagine sometimes one of these children we haven't even trained you know we're just trying to compensate do the best that we can school being liable for that why have you not trained you know staff what the heck all the time and again Working with special needs children, it seems a good number of them non-white. Like, hey, how much of a priority is this in terms of safety in there? We don't even arrange the lesson plans so that they maximally benefit our unique population. Play around with sex. Joke is on the offspring. Other folks who dialed in with a hand up. Star six one, line should be open. And I'll be heard. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Are you sure? I, I, I'll yield to you. Ladies is first on the program, I believe. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, Gus. Um, uh, thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to call in. I had a couple of uh, workplace um, reports I wanted to share with you that I think would fall in the category of tacky. Um, first report happened, I want to say, uh, before the 4th of July. They had a uh, I guess a barbecue and, you know, everybody went out to, you know, eat. Um, however, I, you know, took my lunch as usual, did not attend. Um, some Shortly sometime after that, you know, I'm sitting at my desk, minding my business. A white coworker comes in and says, you know, hey, such and such, I see that there are some hot dogs and there's some watermelon in the uh, refrigerator. Is that yours by any chance? 
And I said, you know, no. I, you know, I thought that was very tacky that, you know, he would ask me uh, that particular question. So, of course, you know, I had my second thoughts on that. Uh, second report um, actually happened today. I was in my office once again. Um, white male manager who I don't, I don't report to him, you know, uh, technically in the office. He actually works in another division. You know, he never, you know, comes to my office or, you know, we really don't have much interaction. But anyway, he wanders back into my office and he starts, uh, you know, talking about random, you know, things, basically holding me hostage in my office. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden he, you know, had the need to, you know, share with me that his wife, you know, is a black woman. And uh, which I thought, you know, why would he be sharing that with me? Yes, uh, Cowbell. And, um, you know, he started talking about, um, you know, about history and how history is, uh, you know, whitewashed and, you know, all these type of uh, interesting uh, common, interesting commentary on certain subjects. And I, you know, just kind of sat there and just kind of listened to him. But I, you know, thought it was interesting that, you know, been at this job almost a year now, and uh, we barely talked. Um, and, you know, that was the first thing that, uh, you know, he felt the need to say. Um, another non-white coworker had kind of uh, hinted or had uh, mentioned in passing that he was married to a uh, black woman, but she said in her own words that, you know, he is uh, apparently the king of his castle, and when this uh, his wife has come to the office, you know, she always comes in, you know, looking at the ground, no eye contact. So um thought it was interesting he would share that with me. Uh, final report um, is uh, on another white male coworker who was sharing uh, some kind of information with me about Ancestry.com, um, about... Um, some celebrity, I guess, tracing his ancestral roots, and they discovered some story of uh, a black male, I guess, in the 1900s, you know, being shot. And he was like, you know, you know, in the white newspaper, they said um, apparently he'd been, you know, shot in the back or whatever. But then the black newspaper, you know, said that he was uh, shot, you know, in his chest. And he says, you know, it's they um, took this trial you know, to court, and, you know, within, I think he said 16 or 17 minutes, the people who shot the black male was uh, acquitted. So, I, you know, it's obviously pretty much um, an homage to what's going on today. And um, those are my uh, three reports I wanted to share. I think of uh, tacky behavior in the workplace, um, and then I will uh, mute my line. Thank you for listening. Much obliged, Rob, for yielding. That is hilarious. Had to come and check to see that you leave your pig feet and fried chicken and watermelon in the refrigerator. I know we just finished up with Juneteenth and had our Fourth of July barbecue. Are you sure that you didn't leave your watermelon and pig feet in the kitchen? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, that's see, that's payback. See, you didn't go and hang out with them for the Fourth of July luncheon. So they say, "Oh no, we we still got to get our fun in. Don't think you're gonna miss out totally. We just come by your office and bam, get our little zinger in there. Um, all of those uh, where they got to come up and do some sort of like unsolicited share. We're here working normal office day, and they got to come up and." Did you know something? I've been swirling for the last five years. Mm hmm. Married to a black woman. You didn't even know that, did you? Hmm? I know all about Negro pain. Celebrated Juneteenth. Look at this. Matter of fact, got my picture. You got my kente cloth. Had a few watermelon and fried chicken myself. History been whitewashed. Terrible what we've done to the Negro. All of that. And she said, I'm just th like, what? W-T-H. What is going on? Why are you telling me this? Do you go and tell all of the people in the office? You got to go and tell them about your adventures swirling. 
how many cool conversations about racism you have with your negro wife all of that especially I got to come and find the black people there like oh yes all about the negro struggle mm. see my wife here mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I view all of that lowering suspicion and I even have it in mind because I mean hey if you're going to say that his wife comes in and this is not some wonderful thing and she's, hey, everybody, look at him in the eye and she looks great and healthy and confident and sure of herself. No. Looking at the floor, almost sound like, is this some sort of abusive thing? You got that type of arrangement? A white man telling this sort of thing to a black female might even be, hey, I had a little hankering for, you know, dark oak, you know. I'm married, but hey, swirling is swirling, you know. Got a little free time. Hey, we get a little watermelon and fry. Matter of fact, unless my memory is bad, this might be the same black female who had said some of these no-count folks on the job had been flirting with her to begin with. Memory might be bad, so, you know. It, is, is Gus T talking crazy? Am I lying on you, ma'am? No, no, Gus, you, you are, you are not. I am the one who, uh, I have been calling about the, uh, issues with the, uh, white males and, well, particularly my supervisor. Luckily, uh, he's out of all the office for quite some time on vacation, so I will get some sort of reprieve, but it does seem like the other, uh, white supremacist in the office, you know, like I said, my, office is pretty much out of the way i don't have a need due to my title to interact with them they're in a different division but you know he made his way back there and said uh you know i'm gonna use your um the coffee maker back here this morning and you know in my opinion that was an excuse to come back there and he stayed and uh talked about you know his wife and um all, all these different things about, you know, African Americans, the role that we played in certain uh, historical, um, uh, you know, uh, events and, you know, how it was uh, whitewashed. And he tried to also leer into the political realm of the, you know, anti-gun and abortion, which, you know, I'm not, none of these topics are obviously safe for work, so I'm not giving any input as he is, uh, you know, just kind of rambling, but, you know, it's kind of one of those situations where um, I'm in a kind of a um, assistant type role. He is a manager, not mine. Um, so it's kind of uh, difficult to maneuver out when someone's uh, standing, you know, in your doorway in your office. So you, in a way, or I feel kind of um, at, at their mercy or kind of held hostage, you know, in the office where I have to, uh, listen you know to that but yeah like i said i haven't i've been there for about a year and i didn't uh i, I don't know why he decided to just share that with me um but yeah I, I am the one who's been calling you know about that so no you have not uh you do not have amnesia all of that is super suspicious like i said uh, he doesn't have a reason to be back there anyway He's not your supervisor. You didn't. She didn't. You know, tell us anything about. Oh man, he came to share some really important information about the company, or you know, something that'll help me out in my next uh, performance evaluation, or at least help me get a better parking place. Nothing. Just you know, integrated bedroom. Want to join us? Nigger has been treated badly. They always say, "Hey, guess who's coming to dinner?" That's what'll fix things does not get any better as she stated from the beginning than tacky and I mean for real it's like anybody I wouldn't care well, what do you mean Gus you know she he, he said that he was married obviously this is not some wonderful arrangement based on what we heard and I mean really system of white supremacy racism this is gutter sex that's all this is sexually sewering somebody hey <laughs> the more the merrier that's what I would be thinking and even the way that she said he did it he comes back where he can hey you can't really go anywhere I can just stand right here this is your work area I am a supervisor and I'm a white man so oh yeah I got lots of power to stand here and yep hold you hostage talk about you know all kinds of things 
mistreatment of the negro hmm. very dangerous and again we're a pattern of this sort of thing in the workplace having all these white dudes come in and being inappropriate at minimum off topic what are you even doing here wasting all this time I did this sort of thing they'd be looking at me Kira what are you doing down here wasting time don't you have some work to do around here flirting with a married white man ought to be ashamed of yourself Jezebel anywho's um and then the TV thinks the same thing. What? You got to come and tell me about what? I don't know if this is the, like, Henry Louis Gates. That's a cowbell, too. I don't know if that's, like, his show. Because uh, they got a lot of those, like, ancestry-type things. And, oh, man, you know, Bill Gates and you know, Kunta Kinte was your fifth cousin type of... What does this have to do with anything? Why are you telling me this? I'm not saying that you need to ask anybody this in the workplace, but I'm just saying, like, rip. What? And... Why would you, a white person, need to come and strike up a conversation about this to me? Have we talked about Ancestry.com before or going through and doing a family tree? Why are you telling me this? And I submit white people do a lot of this. One, it's just the tacky racism, but they do a lot of this in the workplace. Make it seem like they're cool. Get the white, uh, excuse me, get the non-white person not be suspicious I'm a cool white person. I get it. I watch, you know, the Ancestry.com thing and all that. And, oh, yeah, I get it. I know the plight of the Negro. My wife tells me about it all the time. You can, too, if you want to stop by this weekend. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get any better than tacky. Do not eat at the 4th of July luncheons. Uh, Exactly. Bring in your own food. And keep an eye on that. They like to be picky about, you know, all that and what have you. But yeah, I'm not, yeah, we're not doing fried chicken, watermelon, pig feet, or whatever else you all have for your summertime barbecues. Uh, Rob in San Diego, thank you for your patience, sir. Uh, <clears throat> greetings. Um, so I wanted to uh, touch on the last caller speaking on. Uh, the tragic arrangement where the black female looks at the floor. Um, so I've heard of um, that type of treatment in um, two two different areas. Uh, the first area where I heard about it, I'm from the Midwest, um, very close to Chicago, um, and people that classify themselves as pimp um oftentimes talk about having uh girls look at the floor um and if they get caught looking in another place other than the floor it's called reckless eyeballing and um so the second area where i've heard of this treatment um is in the prison setting so in the prison setting, if you look at a guard, a uh, female guard, um, or it could be a male guard, if that's your flavor, um, if you look at a female guard in what's considered a, a sexual manner or what, yeah, if you look at her in that manner, you can get what's called a write-up or a violation for reckless eyeballing. And so bringing it back to the tragic arrangement, um, when I first heard of this uh, treatment of having people look at the floor in my Midwestern area, I thought that uh, black people uh, had created that, right? And then so now going back to that tragic arrangement um, brings me back to um, a time I heard about in history where um, black people couldn't look white people in the face and had to move off of the sidewalk if, like, you know, if a white person was coming. Uh, So I find that very interesting. Um, And the San Diego police officers uh, who don't have to be vaccinated, um, now, I find that story very interesting because, like I said, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm used to 
a very different type of treatment from uh, police enforcement officials. Like, when I, as a black male, when I move around in Milwaukee, like, I'm used to the police, like, watching me, like a hawk eye, having a hawk eye on me. Like, and if you even move wrong, they're going to pull you over. Um, you know, they just be on top of you, man. Um, and so out here, um, I don't really have police officers look at me. And I, you know, it's a, it's kind of like a weird space to be in. So I don't know, like, maybe I'm not in the right areas out here or, you know what I'm saying? Whatever I know is, you know, still the same treatment for the most part. But in this area, I haven't experienced, um, any interaction with police enforcement officials or I haven't like felt like the um like a negative energy when I'm passing them. And so my workplace situation this week, um the Hispanic white that is uh my supervisor, uh which is like you like twenty years younger than me, you're like my son, I basically uh so Monday, um, another coworker asked me, could I stay past my original, uh, time to stay and help out? And I said, no problem. And so while I was helping out, um, I was in one position for, I want to say like six and a half hours or something like that. And so, um, the ju- where we're at, we work in the kitchen, so the, the the positions are supposed to rotate. Okay, so now he's the kitchen lead, and so it's about an hour and a half past the time that I'm supposed to be there. So I say, hey, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take a ten minute break. Um, you know, I'm kind of tired of being on the fryer. Uh, can you have somebody take over? Uh, be like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna have you know such and such take over, whatever, whatever. I take my break, come back, and there's nobody covering this position. And when I go back to the kitchen lead, I ask, I'm like, hey, uh, are you going to, you know, cover that position? And his response was, well, no, I can't right now. I'm busy with this. And so um, what I did, I punched out, you know, because at this point, you know, I'm just helping out. But so today they had a manager's meeting. And so lo and behold, because the actual procedure is that you're supposed to rotate the position, you know what I'm saying? But like, it's like a click in there. So certain people get stuck in certain positions. And so now they're going to put like the list up and then, the rotation and position, the positions are going to rotate every couple of hours. And uh, that's the end of my report for the week. And thank you for taking the call. I will mute my line. Much obliged, Rob, in California. Um, those repetitive uh, action positions where you're just kind of doing the same thing over and over and over, like, you know, that's, not safe uh, for many, many reasons. He even said that's not their own policy and procedure. The positions are supposed to rotate uh, in the kitchen or what have you. Especially, I've totally forgotten that in this instance, Rob was helping out. This was not like, you know, my shift or what have you. Like, I'm doing you all a solid, just trying to pitch in the cover <clears throat> so that you all can get through the day okay, get through the shift at least okay. And basic, like, hey, oh, yeah, he's, you know, absolutely rotating right now take an extra five minutes on your break when you come back you know pick which station you want to be on thank you for you know doing us a solid nah 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 (laughs) no type of you know appreciation gratitude for all your hard work he had said before like times where i work in the kitchen things run smoother folks who operate the joint acknowledge that like man rob is here like we are clicking he's not here like no, everything we just not efficient. Taking all this extra time to get orders out and everything. No gratitude for Negro hard work again. 
Absolutely. And then they have the meeting to acknowledge, yeah, I guess we are supposed to uh, rotate these, which they already knew. This is, again, not uh, ignorance. We're not talking about racist man, racist woman, but I mean, still, same thing. Not ignorant about this policy. They know it's supposed to be rotated. Yeah. As he said, we have so called clicks. And that's also very common in the workplace where the folks who are in the inner circle, the click, they get the choice assignment. I mean, sometimes this can be really galling because sometimes that means that they get the the better shifts. It doesn't just mean that they get, I don't have to be on the fryer for the you know whole five hour shift or whatever. I don't have to come in. Maybe if somebody is, is doing the scheduling and we're cool, they never schedule me so that I don't have to work 530. I mean, this can be, you know, something that is really ugly. That's not just, oh, I get a, a slight of like, I get all kinds of hookups because we are the click and you black get back even when you are a hard worker who does well here black male privilege again let's see uh, before we nap some of our other callers get in emails also uh, this is our female victim she has the uh, black female supervisor oh, excuse me sorry, sorry, sorry white woman supervisor and then she has a black female who is her uh, subordinate so called uh, hi Gus and callers yes I meant the non white black female who allegedly reports to me is bleaching her skin yikes her hands are at least 10 shades darker than her face man and you are very correct she has ratted me out more times than I can count not only did she state in a team meeting that she has no work to do she also forwards emails I send to her to my racist manager and blind copies her into her responses to my emails her betrayals take many forms black brothers and sisters unlike Seattle it is very hot where I am let's give a a live check in Seattle current temperature is let's see Currently 72 degrees. Oh, yep. <laughs> spoke too soon. 71 Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius. So, I don't know. I guess for most places in the U.S., that is, and it's still sunny here. It's seven o'clock. Sun is still out. That is not scorching heat. Continuing. Uh, very hot where I am. The non-white black female was on a Zoom call with me, but kept her camera off. She informed me that she was naked because she was hot. I carried on as though I didn't hear she has no boundaries and continues to disclose her personal life. I would never like on Jeffrey Tubin. I would never disclose to a colleague, white, non white, doesn't matter. Oh, I'm new. It's just so hot. Yeah, man, I can't I can't even put my boxes on me. <laughs> what? Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, I agree, non-white people do not think like white people. Hey, said that today already. White people I've worked with on several plantations have undertaken actions to sabotage non-white people who have left a plantation. This has happened to me. Or where the white racist has left the organization but is still close to racists within the organization. I don't think we as non-white people understand the level of unjust networking carried out by racist man and woman for sure. And very few of us behave this way although some non-white people have adopted some unjust practices we've seen racists do. I don't think it's to the same degree because the level of vindictiveness white people have is not shared by non-white people we also do not have the power to mistreat white people so invariably any mistreatment is projected towards other non-white people it's been about three weeks since the who I am slot was introduced at weekly divisional meetings last week a racist suspect created a whole presentation taking us through his whole life she has that written in all caps like everything kindergarten for real for real dang he even went as far as providing pictures of his house jesus what should have been a five minute slot probably lasted 15 minutes i missed this week's meeting because i've been on leave for the last three days earlier in the week my manager brought up the topic in our team meeting 
randomly as there's no reason to bring this up no one in the team has booked their slot yet including my racist manager but I have a feeling I'm the only person she is interested in there are probably around 50 people in our division so she'll have a long wait I'm in no rush last week I mentioned incompetent Carrie tried to get me to do her work I logged off for the weekend and left her to it my manager was on leave that day and returned to the office on Monday but Carrie was on leave Surprise, surprise, she didn't finish the work and did not leave any information about the work. Needless to say, she did not do what she was supposed to. My manager was copied into the email correspondence, so she was well aware of what had happened. However, I received the racist, passive, aggressive mistreatment, even though Carrie was at fault and that is also very common unfortunately where a white person like this is clearly their assignment they didn't get the Rona or Ebola and oh I'm sick I just can't do it They're just lazy and shiftless white person they will try to pawn their work off on some non-white people and if that fails and the work doesn't get done they don't go and grab old Carrie and grab her by the scruff of her what is wrong lazy heifer and they don't do that they go find the victims why didn't you help out Carrie? You knew she's been having a tough time. Her dog passed away. All the rest of it. All the trials and tribulations we've been going through. They'll do that sort of thing. It's like, wait a minute. I got... What are you talking about? Carrie doesn't even have a dog. Well, you know. Her neighbor's dog. Continuing. My racist manager gave me several assignments to complete, even though I was working on other projects. So... I sent her an email and asked her to let me know which one took priority. Awesome move. So I sent her, I am, I am sure nothing was said to Carrie on her return. I was so annoyed I booked three days leave to de-stress. That is so important and I, I certainly i am aware many times racists they do not, they put us in positions where we can't take leave time. Uh, we don't have personal leave. They penalize us maybe even uh, for having leave time. Very common. If you have the ability to get that day off, two days off, three days off even, hey, awesome. Renourishing, replenishing is so vitally important. So frequently we don't do that. Gusty included, Gustav. Uh, we don't do that. We just get, you know, bullied, terrorized daily, monthly in the workplace and hey I'm gonna take some time totally unplug rest eat some really healthy food make sure that I get lots of great rest drink some water just totally get away from that whole work environment enjoy some of my free time <sighs> summertime go to the beach get your hammock uh, PS keep on keeping on is a song by Curtis Mayfield escape and MC light also gave a song with the same title keep on keep oh yes yes I'm a big Curtis Mayfield fan uh, much obliged uh, our female caller uh, stay safe in the work environment stay on your codification for the workplace both to neutralize the victim female poor confused thing and the racist whites all of them uh, man, I can only, like man I remember being confused about racism I don't know if I was that confused but I would definitely even if you're doing like the zoom thing right you're working from home this summer. Let's say it's you know heat wave where you are. You don't have air conditioning. Even then, I would not disclose if you are in your birthday suit. Other folks who we have missed totally. If you have commentary to share, uh, line should be open. Proceed. Mm. Mm. Oh goodness, I'm sorry. I thought I had enough time to swallow that by me. All right. What's up, everyone? I'm sorry, in Louisiana. Hope everyone is doing well, or at least better than I am. Thanks, Gus, for the show tonight. I'm calling to report on some things. Um, okay. So I just want to report, number one, mainly, Mr. Fuller is absolutely correct when it comes to his theory or what he says about the four-wall method when it comes to replacing the system of racism, white supremacy, with justice, or practicing common racist codes. 
I was basically kind of drawn into um, certain organizations because of some of the, um, I guess you could say, semi-educational work I had been doing um, with some youth. And um, out of concern for a youth that was illegally um, arrested uh, this past school year, trying to get parents involved, so forth, so on. So um, basically in response to what happened, um, some people had been congregating after city council meetings or before, I'm not sure, I would listen to them online, I wouldn't be at the Eventually, they met up and decided to uh, start a nonprofit organization that was supposed to be um, to help uh, black adults and teens minimize contact with law enforcement. But it transitioned to uh, a nonprofit that funds upstart nonprofits um, and some other bullcrap to be frank, which is, I'm sorry, that's, you know, symbolic, but that's the only um, jargon I have for it that fits. Um, And just things, one thing led to another, and and what I had noticed basically is I believe there has been an interception by uh, a race culture that is not civilian. I'll put it that way. Um, And he did really pretty good cloaking because there's a lot of um, ego involved when non-white black people appoint themselves to positions of so-called leadership without the um, decision or the uh, appointment of the masses of the people, which I don't think would be necessarily easy to accomplish if it's accomplished at all. But either way, um, they appoint themselves for whatever uh, egotistical or personality defective reasons, and they have to be seen, and they have to be in front, and they, what I've noticed is um, because they vie for the attention and for literally seats at the table, which this is something some of them have said, um, they're unwilling to be warned, told, suggested, pointed to historical reference about possible practitioners of racism and white supremacy in the midst or activities that are beyond the shadow of the doubt, practices of racism. So what ended up happening, there's a farmer's market that has been going on, and the person in charge of the farmer's market is a racist suspect that I had an exchange with a while back, not a heated exchange, but I asked him a series of questions because he pretended like he didn't understand how things got this way, air quotes, in regard to racism and white supremacy. I asked him if he grew up in the continental United States of America or somewhere else. He said he grew up here, and then he proceeded to go on and say that he didn't know if he was white. And then I told him I was leaving. And the non-white female that was there, I said, I have to go. So um, moving forward, that was last year. So this past week, uh, there was a meeting for this farmer's market that um, he has, and I found out a non-white, unhoused black man has been providing sound successfully and to the uh, enjoyment of the crowd. But the non-white man asked me or told, well, he asked me if I had any work he could do because he needed some money. And I asked him, how could you need money when you've been doing sound at the farmer's market for said white person? And he said, well, he didn't say anything to me about paying me or anything. And, you know, it's okay. I just want to see the farmer's market thrive. I said, no, that is un- that's incorrect. He's getting money for this. I'm sure it's funded somehow, privately or publicly. I'm going to go to the farmer's market and I'm going to, uh, or to the meeting and I'm going to speak on your behalf. Are you willing for me to do that? He said yes. And then I got an invitation by a non-white victim of racism who is sexually incorrect. Um, so, you know, that's his biggest thing. Um, and I probably reported working with him before and I had to stop working with him because of his sexual incorrectness being something that he wants to push as a, a, a main objective in the community. But, 
no, excuse me, not community where black people reside, us along with them. Um, so just in the spirit of goodwill and good faith, um, I accepted his offer. I told another person about the meeting, and that person revealed to me that she wanted to go in order to address the um, what she considered unfair, air quotes, um, uh, application fees and uh, insurance that's required for vendors to have. And it was a $100 application fee, and she was required to put uh, the city, or she was told she would be required to put the city and the farmer's market on her liability insurance, and she didn't see how it was worthwhile considering where they have it. There isn't any uh, traction. And the only person out there really selling anything is the white man. So it's really his, it's his thing. So when we got to the meeting, the non-white person that invited me was there that sexually confused. The non-white unhoused gentleman was there. The black uh, female came in a little bit later, but I called myself using tax, and I asked the suspected racist why he hadn't paid the unhoused black man for his sound services for the past two Sundays, and he immediately got mad right in the face and said, well, I'm not even getting paid. I didn't know he wanted to get paid. I said, well, did you have any discussion with him before you allowed him to repeatedly provide these services? Then he goes, hey, so-and-so, you need to get paid? And then he goes, well, is this how the rest of the meeting is going to go? Because I'm still mad from the last time, damn it. And such and such and such and such. And so I looked at the non-white male that's confused, sexually confused, and I said, oh, does he talk to the black people like this all the time when he gets upset? He goes, it's not because you're black. And so I said, excuse me, I'm just asking questions. You are raising your voice and you are cursing. I said, now you're becoming defensive. I can't say why, only you can. But if you have an issue with a question like this with one person in regards to integrity, then we can't assume you have integrity with anyone or anyone else. So either you don't have integrity or you've made a mistake. Just let us know which one it is. But because of that, him starting or having that behavior, it sparked a whole new thing of absolute drama and inappropriateness to the point I won't bog down the audience with it. But now I had to basically get a restraining order against someone because this sexually confused person is in league with another sexually confused person. And, of course, because confused, they act like women instead of what they were born as, which are men, and they hee on and gossiping and stuff. And then this other person decided to get in my face, and me being who I am, still learning, I basically told him, you shouldn't be in my face. You need to get out of my face. I'm talking to someone else, not you. And so, yes, I did leave, but at the same time, he said something very menacing and threatening while I was on the way out. And I take threats seriously, Um, so I filed a police report, and I proceeded to try to get an emergency order of protection, which didn't work because the suspected racist judge said, well, she can't understand how I was in fear of my life. I guess a person has to sound a particular way if someone can inform me and let me know what that is. Is it a squeal? Is it a, is it a, the, I don't know, what's her name, Sally, a Sally Field type emotive I need to give, you know, like, oh, my God, like, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to do it, but if someone can inform me, let me know, because other than that, I think as I proceed, I'm going to have to substitute this judge, which I have no problem doing, but, My biggest problem is I try to tell these individuals we need to calm down before it got bad. We need to calm down because what you all are all forgetting is that we are at this point because a white person practiced racism and now we're fussing with each other instead of figuring out a codified way of either not dealing with this man or something, because he's positioned himself too far among the people. And they think something about him that is not true. But they didn't want to hear it. But literally, it's like 
white supremacy has literally made everybody un- ineligible for mental health and logic sometimes. So that's that report. If you're trying to do something, so-called do something, or make a difference, or be constructive, just follow the code. I'm to a point now, I'm done, done, done trying to do anything for the general populace. I'm sticking to these after-school programs, kind of like retired firefighter with the kids. Where I can ask questions. They can ask me questions. We can learn something. I can leave, and that'll be the end of it. My cape is gone. United, independent. I just have to be concerned about my survival unit because the behavior I saw among non-white people, if there's a situation where society collapses, where I'm at right now, unfortunately, would be the first to go completely berserk. Um, so I suppose that's my workplace racism. I know it's not workplace racism. I know it's not a traditional workplace, but I consider work also a place where you, you know, exchange your energy for some type of purpose. And, and technically it was work because I've had to, I had signed up and, and, you know, said I was a part of an organization that I'm no longer a part of, and I, it, we're at a dissolution, so I don't know. It's almost like quitting or firing or something. And also my son um, found it best to resign from his job because after he pointed out in specific detail, point by point, the OSHA violations at this restaurant he was working at, he felt that at that the white female was basically setting him up to be fired. So he gave his resignation, citing the safety issues and um, also citing that he didn't feel they valued him as a, uh, you know, something he said he was trying to uh, leverage with them um, as far as his marketing skills so he could try to do a lateral move and they were, you know, they weren't trying to do that. But black self-respect, he quit. Um... I really do pray that things get better for all nine white people in the known universe and, you know, just send positive energy my way, please, because I, now I have to deal with court stuff because we're just totally bamboozled about the system of racism and white supremacy. Don't go the four wall method. <laughs> the end. I'll meet my line. Thank you. Much obliged, uh, Irie, in Louisiana. Uh, I'm of the opinion threats should be taken seriously, like all threats, uh, totally, especially any sort of work environment or whatever. And you got people that are being threatening and menacing. Oh, yeah, take that extra serious. I'm always of the opinion because people, Dylan Roof, we've been talking about Peyton Gendron, Joey 22, especially everything happening right now. Absolutely. Any, and we talked about that with uh, Gavin DeBecker, The Gift of Fear, Cal's Book Club. Or Catherine Massey Book Club now, but at the time, it was the Cal's Book Club. Anywho, uh, I'm all about taking that super serious. So I think you did the correct thing there, even though the judge, you know, they practice racism too, but at least you do all you can. The uh, And then to get to this point, all of this black male privilege unhoused black male doing the sound at the farmer's market I love the farmer's market should go this weekend maybe tomorrow encourage you all to go to the farmer's market too put those Cheetos down do some sounds at the farmer's market make it more enjoyable people spend more time maybe spend more money win win for everybody right pose to make sure hey you down here let's make sure we put a few nickels in and hey maybe you'd like to buy some asparagus while you're down here huh Get a roof over your head. How about that? Nah. Nah. Go try to get this fella some money. Immediately. What what, 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 what do you mean? I'm not even getting paid. Now pause right there. Now really. You're not getting any sort of compensation for this at all. That right there. Like, ooh, buddy, I suspect you lied. It's been my experience. White people don't do tons of things where they're going to do a whole lot of time and energy where they're not compensated in any way 
Hmm. Even if that is the case, and I'm saying I don't believe that, but whatever. Even if that is the case. Dang. All of this here, and he's doing sound system, and he's coming back on a weekly basis. If people are enjoying it, they're taking it in, like, what the heck? Like, we can't get him a few nickels, something? Fruit basket, <laughs> literally, something? Come on, man. Come on. This problem could be solved today. White people like it this way. We like seeing these down and out niggers. Oh, if only somebody could do something. I don't know. Hmm. Eh, oh well. Watermelon? Hey! Go to the meeting. Just again, just trying to get them. I mean, this is not, hey, let's, we need a mansion. We need a yacht. Lifetime supply of po' boys. Nope. Just a few nickels. Can we compensate him if he's going to come into Ah, ah, all of this. And Neely Fuller does have at the beginning of his books, if you don't understand white supremacy racism, what it is, how it works, everything else will confuse you. And that sounds like a whole room full of confusion. We don't understand what it means to be white, so we just argue and bicker. I said that way back at the beginning of the program today. Like, we start off with all that. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my genitals. Oh, man. Nothing else. We, confusion. That's where we're going. Can we get this fella a few nickels? Man, we got restraining orders and all this chaos. And, incidentally... Gus T. Worthless Negro from Virginia. That's it. We do consistently make an effort. Hey, talking about racism, white supremacy, talking about pu- uh, publicly, not going to be doing any name calling, cursing, all of that. Try to keep courteous dialogue. Once you start down that route, especially if people are having disagreements, there's a conflict about something, and all that extra cursing and filth flaunt, we it can get way out of control. Now we started off to solve A, we didn't do that, and now we got restraining orders and enforcement officers and all this. Did we get to A? Nope. Big advocate of staying calm. It sounded like she was the only one, Irie in Louisiana, trying to stay calm, just asking questions and figuring out, even imploring folks, hey, let's watch our emotions. Just try to stay calm. Nah, I don't want to I got to talk. <sighs> seen that frequently where you can just have one white person can come and disrupt everything not a coincidence uh, caller in Florida should be with us as well uh, folks we've missed totally Yes, sir. May I be heard? <clears throat> Angry black male in North Florida. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Greetings to Gus, the host, the listeners and callers. Uh, I wanted to share some reports. Um, the first is the manager in the area that I work in, segregated area. Um, a black female, she was saying that, oh, you know, I want to, I want to test you on something. And it's, and this is why I was just me and her in the area. And she said, if I knew what dates the, uh, the judgment for uh, ju- divorce decree judgments, if they're before like the 1930s or something like that, where would I go to find them? And I said, I know mainly it's on the H and records part of the site. Um, and she said I was correct. And then she also added that, that there is a cartridge that, uh, that's on the shelf next to where I'm seated. So she said that I asked the other two, uh, coworkers that's seated in the area, a white woman, a black female. So I don't know if this was a strategic or whatever, but later on that day, she walked in there and then walked in the office, 
uh, step in the doorway of where her office is and says, well, well, you all, you know, I asked, I asked uh, him my name. If he knew the answer to that question, he got it right. And then so he, <laughs> the reaction, like, oh, oh, okay, okay. And then the white woman, suspected racist, black fiancé, um, got three children from black males. She says, oh, oh, I know, I know what it was. You probably was helping them out. You helped them out with the answer, smiling and everything like that. So I just got up and walked to go do my next job. So I thought about that when you say it, just, it can just take just one, just one white person can cause so much disruption. And I think that was an act of racism. Uh, the next point is when I heard the audio segment about the work at home remote, remotely and everything, it reminded me of that same white person and the, uh, the victim of racism. Now, I was coming in like 756, 757, not just was, but still, still am most of the time. Uh, I'm coming in before the eight o'clock. That's the standard time, and no one else is there. I'm there before everybody. They get to come in like a quarter after, by eight fifteen, and then, you know, it's not that I really have an issue with it, but I'm thinking, in some ways, am I being treated correctly? Am I being accommodated in certain ways? So. Uh, one morning she mentioned that she worked from six in the morning to eight o'clock and then came in and clocked in at eight fifteen. So I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and I don't know how often they are allowing certain, um, arrangements like that to go on. Uh, and in situations like that also, they'll use a black person to say that they'll, you know, they'll give her that same uh, access, but mostly it's being given to white people. And and it also reminded me of how I shared this as well with the furloughs and the, the warden who retired, and I think she's, once again, she's still in contact with a lot of the white women clan. So she said, oh, at the beginning of 2021, you know, uh, we're going to stop the furloughs for the records department but don't you all tell anybody, don't tell anyone, you know? So I still have that email to this day, but it just shows how the, the sneaky, uh, conniving ways of white supremacists. Um, my next one is there was, now I did get, and which, you know, this can be tacky at times too. I got a compliment from a black doctor. You know, I thought this was constructed from UF, University of Florida, and she um, sent she sent it to my supervisor, and they put it in the newsletter. Now, black person. Now, I thought that was you know suspicious, so but I just said okay, I was appreciative of it. But they'll do things like this to make it seem like they are treating me correctly. But there's a lot of other injustices going on, and. For example, just like on the first page of the new of the June twenty twenty two, now they have pictures of the black male, the HR person, and and the uh, the, the clerk serving hot dogs and um, beans and you know chips, all this type of stuff. And uh, he his message for the the month was like. Oh well, you know, I just wanted to share something. I had a friend who was who was in a hot dog sausage eating contest, and he ate twenty something hot dogs, and he went on and won a second place in the contest. I was like, "What has got to do with anything, man? Like, are you serious right now?" So that was attacking this in the recent newsletter, um, and I have two more. I was in the break room, and you got two. Uh, MAGA white women they were talking and I had just walked into the area and I sat sat down at the chair 
you know, ready to eat and everything. And one of the white women gets up and walks to the sink and says, oh, well, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure I didn't offend you or anything, saying this to the other white woman. I just wanted to make sure I didn't offend you by that name because, you know, you got to watch what you say around here. You know, at least I didn't call you mama or something like that. Uh, she says, oh, no, you're, you're, you're fine. You're fine. And, uh, and she started mentioning about the supervisor, the black lady, black female, because, you know, she just got to get a backbone. She got to get a backbone to um, be a, a supervisor. And then the white woman responds and says, yeah, and a better personality. That was her response. Now, both of these, well, one of them is the current supervisor, and the other was a uh, supervisor in the other building. Um, but other than that, I can't really think of any other updates. Um, but, yeah, that's pretty much it for what I have right now. Thanks for allowing me to share. Much obliged. Caller in Florida. Hot dog got mentioned a lot today. Like, I've eaten my share of hot dogs. I do not recommend. They said they've got, like, lots of studies where they talked about that. Like, all that processed meat, that sort of thing. That's right there with Lunchables. Like, absolutely horrible. Much less the 25 of them. Like, come on. That's white culture. Um, go the other way. Talking about the, the black female supervisor got to come in and they start off with the whole mocking thing. <laughs> you got to watch what you say around here. My goodness, can't you just say any old thing you want? Well, we are in the work environment. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I don't talk the same way I do when I'm chilling at home, but that's not the point. See, this is, oh yeah, they're going to try and report us, say that we've been unjust, racist, harassing folks around here, see. And they get into that, there's no count of black females, you just need to get a backbone. Wow. That that sort of thing suggested we just got cowardly black people, you know, just get the feelings hurt real quick. This, these little children, they're just so sensitive. If they would just grow up and be adults, this whole thing would be fine. She says, yeah, yeah, get, get a backbone and a better personality. That's right. Tell it, girl. Dang. <laughs> Even imagine you're at work and you're sitting out publicly talking this way about a supervisor. Not the janitor, not the cafeteria lady who chops the watermelon, a supervisor. She's a coward, needs to get a backbone and a better person. Like, dang, that's not just, you know, you got dirty fingernails and I don't like her shoes. Did you see her? She's wearing flats five days in a row. That's like way beyond. Black supervisors. Yes. In charge. Yes. Hmm. Seems like lots of the black supervisors over there catch it, get that sort of accusation. You don't even have a backbone, you know? Come in with it, like I said, those hot dogs, all that stuff will kill you. Uh, the overtime, that's one that I think is important. Uh, we talked about that consistently in terms of where you do not have consistent enforcement of policy and procedure. Where if they're going to have some people where they can clock in and get all kinds of overtime, like I don't even. You, I think she said she clocked in at 6 a.m., clocked out at 8 p.m. or something crazy like that. Like, good God, like, that's 14 hours. Like, we're not even getting into now. Were you working for 14 hours? You were at the, the, the keyboard flying, <laughs> sweat flying. I'm going through. <laughs> really? We'll leave that alone. But she does her whatever, 12, 14 hour shift that day. And then she said she came and clocked in first thing in the morning the next day. Like, dang. How many hours did you work that week? Talked about this throughout. Uh, caller, he said they had times where they were flip-flopping about the COVID policy. Like if you, you know, a uh, rumor, maybe you tested positive or what have you. The Negro people, get on out of here. Ah. White people, hey, I'm saving my vacation days. You know, you got trips. I'm trying to get to Daytona Beach this fall. I'm not wasting all my, you know, personal leave up on Rona time. You know, I just have to come in here. Y'all just have to deal with it, you know. 
inconsistent enforcement of plan. I mean, that can be huge. Imagine that if you're able to come in and be on the clock for 14 hours, and especially if that was hybrid, like I'm at home, so they can't even be looking over my shoulder to make sure that I'm working and not in here watching YouTube videos in my footies. Come on. Let's see. She comes, he said, the uh, white woman comes in asking trivia or whatever. All of that, like, really? That's your job for today? Come in and ask us trivia questions? Is this like part of our performance evaluation? We get raised or what have you based on, you know, if we know the answer to this? He answers the question, gets it right. Okay. Do I get a raise? No. Peanut? M&M's? Nothing. Okay. They leave, come back, and say, oh, yeah, did you know we got a nigra? I asked him the trivia question for the day, and he got it right. How about that? We got a smart nigra in the segregated section. Can't even just leave it there like, oh, okay, we got our tag. Well, you just helped him with the answer. He didn't know, worthless nigra. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come in bragging. He said he came in like, ah, I knew it. Thought I was going to trip me up like, I know everything around. I'm a smarty art nigger. He didn't say none of that. Didn't say words. <laughs> I'm just here chilling. Eh, I don't think the nigger is that smart. Mm-hmm. Nothing to say. That's why I said before. Uh, I think it's Bay Area Mom. She's talking about the black male who's, who's there. He was, you know, listening off all of his credentials and everything. And, you know, I've studied this and I've done that. Nobody cares. Even most of the non-white people. <laughs> we, we have been brain trashed. We don't care either. You are a nigra, worthless nigra. In fact, I don't care how many trivia questions you get right. Get back over there in the segregated section. I'm of the opinion when you understand all that up front, that better helps you keep from being insulted and stunned. And what do you mean? She's trying to say I'm stupid. What? And being stunned, but even when they talk about the other black people, right? They talk about the black supervisor, <laughs> talking about what a coward and no personality she has, and all the rest of it. Like, I'm not surprised about any of this. That's the way they talk about me too. Even some of the black people, unfortunately. All of that about the newsletter. We talked about that like for years, Bryn, because we <laughs> talked about this. Anything that we can do. Negroes come to the court. Oh, let's get that in the news. Letter. Click, click, click. See, see, see. We are not racist. Don't want to hear no lip from our little disgruntled uh, black male either. Because he's been in the newsletter more than anybody. Talking about he's not a part of the team. We we have heaped praise on him by the bushel. Look at that. Got it in the newsletter right there. All that just so that, yes, we can do that. What do you mean? We're not racist. We got Negroes all over the newsletter. Look at all this. See the little children there? Mm-hmm. So I would tell, make sure you look for the one because I think they put it in the newsletter when the black female got the ugliest costume for Halloween. Make sure you find that one too. Yes, we are. We are all about promoting the niggers. Gus, yes sir, Gus. yes sir. <laughs> oh, just really quick. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but just for context, that is the same black female supervisor, the one with the the ugly sweater or the ugly uh, um, ornament. That's that's the same one for that and where the white woman said to her in the office, well, you don't seem to show any emotion. You don't seem to cry. So that's, you know, to add content, that's the same white woman that said that to the same black female. Doesn't get any better than tacky. That's what they can celebrate me for. Mock me about some ugliest ornament or decoration from some for some goofy holiday the rest of the time. Yeah, you know, show enough emotion. Why don't you come in here and cry for us? <laughs> what? What? I need to cry and get a better personality and get my backbone again. Like, what kind of lame do you think I am? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, system of white supremacy. Yes, I got it. <laughs> I got all of us. Yes, got it. And especially... I'm a supervisor, like, oh, my God, like, they're going to be extra resentful. She could be easily the best supervisor in the courthouse. We don't care. You're a nigger. Got to make sure you understand that, like, that it doesn't make things perfect. But at least in my view, it goes a long way to keep you from having high blood pressure and getting emotional, as Ari was talking about. Every time where you, you expect these sort of things, you got a catalog of these sort of things. They've been doing this sort of thing the whole time I've been working here. 
doing this until we fix this problem with the system. Just understanding what it means to be white in all its manifestations. But yeah, that is uh, summertime 2022 does not get any better than tacky. And then stuffing down hot dogs too. Like, man, we didn't hear anything good about food today. Everything was bad. Like racist jokes involving food and then eating bad food. We're in the middle of summertime, right? Like, I don't care where you are. Seattle, Florida, Iowa, New York, like wherever. California, my goodness. They got farmers markets. There's no reason anybody should be struggling unless you've just been brainwashed and conditioned like hot dogs. Man, you could be getting anything. Papaya, mangoes, honeydew. Yes, watermelon without the racist jokes. I love water. In fact, look for yellow watermelon. Peaches. I'm going to get cherries right now. Why not that? It's the middle of summertime. Let's do it up. We're going to have a huge fruit bonanza. Nah. They said that for Buffalo, too. They said uh, in the interim when they were getting the tops back together that they went and were cooking. It was the exact same thing. Hot dogs. I don't know if they had 25 hot dogs a person, but hot dogs, hamburgers. I didn't hear any. That's the same nonsense they had at tops to begin with. I didn't hear anything about what they got at the Whole Foods my man went to. That's five miles down the road. Get us some organic figs, dates, papaya, and bok choy, and asparagus, and kale. We can really get our nourishment up. Drop off some old hot dog Oscar Mayer wieners and juicy juice on us. <laughs> Tell us right on, right on. Anywho's anywho, we'll be here tomorrow. The, uh, the Buffalo supermarket opened today, so we'll hear that tomorrow. Compensatory call in 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and we should have another white guest from Buffalo. Like, man. I feel, you know, a little self-conscious, like, man, I hope we're not wasting everybody's time with all this Buffalo talk. We have had a number of people who said that they've been listening to the book club and have learned a lot. I call it a day, Trucker in Houston and the rest of folks like, I think we should for sure be experts or at least I am looking and eager to learn more about all of this with the goal of using this to help me replace white supremacy with justice. So, yes, more white guests from Buffalo to come and I think next week we might even have the replay 2013 when folks were talking about how ignorant Dr. Welsing is and cannabis but (laughs) that is for another day anyway much obliged for everyone tuning in hope it was worthy of your Friday evening sobriety would be best that's what Dr. Welsing said we told her she was crazy not all of us but a good chunk Uh, sobriety would be best Especially not with your coworkers. I forgot to talk about that, but more time to come. Uh, if you are out and about, you see someone being rowdy and hostile, exit. This is not a time for confrontations with strangers. If you're in a vehicle, you are sober, buckled up, and not on your mobile device, doing all the small things that we can do to keep ourselves as safe as possible under white supremacy racism, minimize contact with race soldiers, badge or no that said creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately cow signing up thanks all for tuning in